Oh, hey, watchers. Welcome back to uh, Watching with Strangers. This is our very first episode, Travis. Awesome. My name to... is Kevin Strange. My name is Travis. This is my co-host. I'm the, the co-host. The Encyclopedia Britannica of movie podcasts. Yes, I am. What are Walking we wiki. What are we watching today? Watching Wiki 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 Trav. <laughs> we watched Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max Fury Road. Where the fuck do we start? Let's start at the beginning. Well, the beginning. The very first thing I saw on this updated, brand new. What year was it released? Two thousand fifteen. Yeah, 2015. This 2015 yeah. version of one of the coolest dystopian, apocalyptic sci-fi action series of all time, Mel Gibson's Mad Max trilogy. Right? Minus Mel Gibson. Well, for we're, this one, we're yeah. getting to that here. Yeah. Your spoil, spoiler. I'm a spoiler. Spoiler for what I'm. Spoiler for my no, setup. You break it down basically, and it's 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 kind of a trifecta. It's in the top. I'm not gonna say it's the best car chase movie but it's in the top let's say five car chase movies of all time because essentially what the whole damn movie is is it's a chase a road battle of chase it's one of the best action movies ever made real critics have even said that <laughs> so you know how it is like it, it's weird to even get excited about movies in this era because oh, yeah. the first thing you hear about like the first thing I heard about Mad Max Fury Road was that um um what is the fucking director's name? Not Frank Miller. George, George, George Miller. Miller, Miller yeah. uh, that George Miller was returning to the Mad Max franchise with a reboot. But that's such an epic part of the story, though. So I'm so I'm I'm seeing this info like uh, George Miller is going to reboot Mad Max. I'm like, wow, you know, everything gets fucking remade, but at least it's being remade by the original filmmaker. And and usually when the original filmmaker stays involved, these mm-hmm. things don't turn into complete train wrecks. But this True. dude is like in his 70s at this point, right? Something so I'm like, like that. why in the fuck it's been like how long? 30 years or yeah. 35 years since a since a fucking Mad Max movie has come out? Yeah, and there's there's some story behind that. We're going to get into that. Um first of all, I want to I want to stop you for a second. It's not a reboot. It's not a remake. It was it was, it was touted like it was going. It to was. Be. You're not let. You're. You keep ruin. You keep stepping on me. <laughs> the very first thing I saw about this film was that George Miller was going to remake his Mad Max movie. Mm. And you know how this info is when right. in this day and age when we we see something or hear something about a franchise, people just jump right on top of it and they're all over it and they have made their decision about whether they're going to like a film or not right. based on the first information that comes out oh, about yeah. it. You remember Bat Batfleck? When <laughs> Ben Affleck announced he was going to be Batman, it was the end of the fucking world. The, yeah. the, the, the nerd culture had a fucking meltdown because of a casting choice. And it did end up so, kind of being the end of the world personally. But. <laughs> so, uh, so information kept coming out, right? Then we got word that George Miller has clarified this is not a reboot. It's not a remake. This isn't a reimagining. This movie exists in the Mad Max universe. Mm -hmm. But he's not telling us where it exists in the universe. Okay, all right. Well, so this is just a, this is a, you know, because the Mad Max films themselves, they don't ever give you a really solid clue about where the continuity takes place in each of the films. Right, and we just know it's in the future. We don't know when, but I mean between. Sure I mean between the films themselves, right. we don't where necessarily know what the order of these films even is. Mad Max is sort of a Western character, right? right? George Miller has taken his love for the Western genre and he's turned it into dystopian, apocalyptic right. sci-fi. So Max is just a drifter, and he drifts in and out of these stories almost like a fictional character, almost like a composite character. These events happen in this insane future, and there always seems to be a character named Max right in the thick of it. But this isn't a series that just pick one picks up where the last one left off, right? These are just sort of yes and no. These are yes sort of no, well, actually. We're, we're, like he's actually, we he's actually he's actually talked about that to where I mean yeah we have a different actor we'll get into that, but it's still the same. Character. I don't think we even knew it at that point yet. No, not the, at that the point. The next thing 
Right. The next thing we find out mm -hmm. is Mel Gibson is not returning right. as Mad Max. Now, did that? Did we learn that info at the same time we learned it was going to be Tom Hardy, or was that a separate uh, announcement as well? Well, uh, Miller had on multiple occasions emphasized that he did. He either did, depending on when you talked to him or when he talked to us, he either didn't think Gibson would be interested or didn't think he was appropriate. And, you know, later on, a lot of that appropriateness factor came from some of the things he said and some of the things he did, and then combine that with the age, and then probably even on top of that, the, the cost factor. Um, but it always, it, for the longest time, it seemed Miller was either resigned to the fact or somehow, in some way, shape, or form, knew Gibson wasn't going to return for Fury Road. Well, considering how many movies Harrison Ford action spectaculars Harrison Ford has made older than and in worse shape than Mel Gibson, I think that it probably hinged way more on uh, Mel Gibson being blacklisted by Hollywood in general than it did on uh, any of those other factors. Right. So, so we've got a blacklisted Mel Gibson. Can't be in the movie because he says bad words. <laughs> so did we learn at the time... So, so you're saying he was saying the entire time. Well, yeah, probably not going to have Mel Gibson. Another, he was given and a so, pitch for a long time. And so a lot Since of early 2000s. And so a lot of fans were going, well, if, they, if it ain't Mel Gibson, then fuck it, right? right? So we got this. We got all these weird things. We got an aging director wanting to come back to a franchise he hasn't messed with in 30 years after having done Happy Feet one and two. So he's a completely different filmmaker at this point. He's, he's pretty much a pussy. He's lost his edge. He's making mainstream um, animated movies. And now he wants to come back to the franchise that made him famous. And he wants to do it with a different actor. And all of these signs, to me, they were all red flags. And I'll be honest with you, I never thought this movie was going to get made. Yeah. And we're going to dive into this, of course, today. But that's how it looks on the surface. That's how it looks on the surface. But there's a lot more to it than that. So then... Time goes by, mm -hmm. and the next report I see is that principal photography has begun, mm -hmm. and it's uh, Charlie's Theron mm -hmm. is now the lead of the is is the not we we'll not we'll get into whether she's the lead or not. We, we can if you want to, but that's not what the point of this point this right. part right here is. We knew but she they've, was, ca we knew they've she cast in a, a role. in a significant role. We've got Charlie's mm -hmm. Theron, and we've got Tom Hardy as Max, and everybody went, "Well, it's not, well, well uh, actually, Tom Hardy's cool." Like nobody seemed to have a problem with it once it was announced. Once the casting was announced, and filming got underway, and this is the next thing I heard. I, I saw a little snippet of George Miller saying. Um, I didn't even really write a script for this movie. We just went out and shot one big long car chase, mm -hmm. and I was like, "What?" Well, what it he is, went he out actually, and he actually uh, I read about this. He actually started with the storyboard before he ever wrote, wrote a script. He sat down and they ended up with a total of thirty five hundred. So he ended up with a total of thirty five hundred storyboards, and which whoever had the time to actually count it out, it turns out that's roughly the amount of individual shots. They're in the final film. So he basically draws the movie. Basically. Like yeah. a crazy person. So we've got an old mm -hmm. an old George Miller with a completely different actor going back to a franchise he hasn't touched in 30 years, making a movie on based on pictures. Which for a period of time was potentially, and he thought he wanted to do it as a feature-length animated film. I hadn't heard that part. Yeah. And then and then after he started moving down that road, he decided he didn't like it. It was going to be a 3D animated film, actually. And then sort of in the proverbial last minute, he said, no, I don't like that. I want to do a 3D live action film. And then that was the final, that was the final big road bump before principal photography actually really got started and got going. Reportedly, pre-production on Mad Max Fury Road, or at that time it was just Mad Max 4, began as early as 1997. But due to... A lot of different factors. One of the biggest ones being 9-11 and the Iraq War and the fact that they were looking for a desert to basically shoot the entire movie in. Your options are limited. Where did they end up shooting it at? They ended up shooting they it in New Zealand? They ended up shooting it in Australia. Or Australia, right. Yeah. Um, uh, because the, the, there was a period of time they were looking at a desert, uh, a desert location in Namibia. But again, the Iraq War and security issues and, and shipping costs and stuff factored into that. That didn't work out. And then there's controversy over you know how how this production is affecting you know environmental impact on the on the desert and all this stuff. So I mean it's not a film that's without more than its share of controversy and hurdles that it's gone through, um, but it's mostly been revolving around production and coordination and logistics. So 
filming comes and goes. Mm-hmm. It happens. This movie gets made. And again, I was skeptical all the way up to when he was like, I'm in the desert and I'm shooting a movie with pictures. <laughs> right. I'm shooting a movie without a script. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, this is going to be an unmitigated disaster. And then the teaser trailer came out. Mm-hmm. Holy fucking <laughs> shit. Did the internet take a shit on its own fucking self? I don't remember. Was the, the flame throwing uh, guitar? Yes, the Doof in the, in the Warrior was in the teaser. Yeah. So the <laughs> teaser opens up. It's the desert. Mm-hmm. There's a fucking caravan of. There's a war party just. What else would you have in that night? Tearing night? down the middle of the fucking desert, shooting up fucking dust everywhere. And then you see these fucking guys completely covered in fucking white powder with face paint on. They look like fucking American Indian warriors. They look like fucking tribal. And right. they're on these fucking poles, like Cirque du Soleil, flopping back and forth on these poles. And you see these flares going off in the sky. I actually want to see this. I want to see Cirque du Soleil and Fury Red. Yeah, well, it basically <laughs> is. I mean, that right. movie, basically, there are sequences yeah. in the film that are such beautiful violence with oh, these fucking, they call them polecats, bobbing back and forth. Well, the whole movie is nothing but violence, and, or beauty and violence. We're getting ahead of ourselves. We are. We, we are, are getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Slow down, so slow this down. teaser trailer comes out and basically blows the whole dick off the entire internet. The internet spends the next week scrambling around finding pieces of its own dick trying to glue it back together. Remember this guy? Because (laughs) this motherfucker. So all the doubts I had and all the doubts that the entire internet had at this point are completely gone. And we are just going. And when does it come out? May 20. What was it? May 21st? Is that when it came out? It was. uh, I think so. May. Yeah. Sometime in May. And we were like, and how fucking much longer do we have to wait? And it was like fucking five months early or something so it was like right. it was like a January or February release for the teaser trailer and we were like oh my fucking <laughs> god and for me personally since again like in the in the internet age you start off learning about the I uh, I woke up with an idea the director mm-hmm. gets interviewed going yesterday I, w- on the, I was taking a shit on the toilet and I had an idea for a film like we know right. as the audience we are engaged with the filmmaking process from the moment it's it's it gets started before pre-production even starts on a, on a on a property and in order for me personally to stay excited and stay engaged in the movie I want to see I at a certain point when I make that decision it's getting my $15 on opening night I shut down I do an internet I do an internet blackout and I won't I won't look at because there end up there ends up being like 20 to 30 still images three or four trailers yeah. All kinds. And then you never know when the trailer's going to give it a, a, a crucial thing away, give you a spoiler. Because very you know, often that's and what you never trailers... know when the trailer's going to mislead you. It's like you know, trailer makes you think it's going to be something that ends up being something totally different. Or they just make the movie in two minutes. They give you right. the they give you the introduction, the uh, conflict, the climax, and everything but the very end of the resolution. Yeah. Um, or with comedies, you see all the funny bits in the trailer. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I there's your Adam Sandler movies, no funny bits at all. There's. A, <laughs> There's a certain point where I uh, where I check out and and I go on a blackout and that was the teaser trailer yeah. for Mad Max. I didn't watch a single other trailer. I didn't read a single other interview. I didn't look at any of the the only still image that got through my blackout was the fucking Doof Warrior, <laughs> and I was looking at this thing going, "What in the fuck <laughs> is that? What are we in for?" So uh, where where were you around this time? Um, no, I'm I'm on board with you there. I mean, because honestly, I, I think we've we've kind of lost sight of the true art and the thrill of a teaser trailer. They they when they use them, they use them way too early. I mean, there's a I mean, you're supposed to put them out there early. They're called like teasers, but you you know when they use them, you you get a teaser trailer that's a year or more out from the movie's release. It's like by the time the movie comes out, you for you know it's it's not gonna stay in your memory unless it's something really really crucial. But there's an element of mystery that needs to be uh, present in a teaser trailer. I, my earliest experience that I can remember with a teaser trailer, just on a slight tangent here, Fifth Element. I don't know if you remember when I first started marketing on that. Mm-hmm. All I remember is there's these five lines that came out of this like like starry space thing. And then as they got closer, they come out, and it was just these five lines, and it just gave a date. And it was like, what the fuck was that? What the, is that? The one so I re- simple and minimalistic, but it got us all going... Holy shit. The one I yeah. remember, I, I don't remember what movie it was it was put on, but it was dropped on a new release videotape re-release or re-release re- uh-huh. of some new movie and it was you heard dun 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 right. 
and then there was like a T one thousand case, and you saw a T one thousand, and then it was like you just see like the eyes, was, the, the the red eye light up out of the darkness, and then like the logo or the title or whatever. I, I don't and remember said, what it was. Yeah, T two, right? Judgment Day. Well, you know what it is, and whether you expect it or not, you're still just as excited. I'm just as know? excited about it today as I was <laughs> then. That teaser trailer is fucking badass. But any more teaser trailers? It seems to me like any more teaser trailers are just. Um, Truncated, uh, abbreviated trailers. Yeah, so the, there's nothing mysterious about the first it. trailer nothing. minus thirty seconds. Right, exactly, and and we get so many. I mean, some movies we get what three, four, five versions or different trailers. Like, well, by the time I see the movie, I'm gonna see have seen half of it. All right, we got a lot to get through, yeah. so let's let's get to the, the let's get to the damn movie itself. <laughs> so, opening night comes. I my ass is in a seat. I don't know how long it took you to see it, but I got there. Plop my 1850 down for my 3D glasses. I walked in, I sat down, and I cannot remember the last time. Yeah, I can. The last time I yelled out, What the fuck? While I was watching the movie was when I saw the double feature of uh, Gr- of, uh, of Planet Terror and. Right, yes. uh, yeah, the yeah, Grindhouse that, that double feature, yeah. yeah. And and it was over the stuff that happened in Planet Terror. I was <laughs> screaming, what the fuck am I watching? Um, that's about the only other time I can remember in recent history that I have just been completely WTF'd. Yeah. This movie was so loud, so bizarre, and so, in the best ways. And so dense with world building that when it was over... All I could think was, I think I may have picked up 25% of what this movie was. It was too weird, too loud, too chaotic for me to get any of what they were trying to give me. And I have to see it again immediately. And it's so, so incredibly efficient as a film. And by that, I mean, it's such, it's a go, go, go movie. It does not stop. It's, you start watching Max taking a piss, eats a lizard, and bam, it's fucking go time. And there's no stopping. There's no stopping. From the it's next so second. kinetic, so energy packed, so fluid. So about forty five seconds into the film, till the <laughs> till the the final fade out, right. there is no relaxing. There is barely there's a there's a small moment in the film we'll get to as we break down the right. whole film mm-hmm. where it lull, lulls down for just a second, but all that does is prep you for the insanity that the final course is going to be. So it's not like the movie runs out of steam. The right. movie just takes a breath. It allows you to take a breath. It takes a breath and it allows you as the audience to rest your eyes for a second, rest your ears for a second, mm-hmm. and sort of try to absorb everything you just saw because this Mad Max movie mm-hmm. is nothing like any of the other Mad Max movies. It exists in Definitely the same not. it exists in the same universe, but it's like you took standard definition and upgraded to high definition. Or it's like you took Mad Max and put it under a microscope where suddenly you can see every crack, every crevice, every single facet of this world is on display right in front of your eyes in a way that either filmmaking didn't allow, George Miller's experience didn't allow or his budget didn't allow for the other films and sort of um i think uh, beyond thunderdome was a was a step in this direct each mad max movie has been a step yes. in this direction Jerry where things Road get is the, is, the, is the masterpiece things get that a little makes you look critically at his previous work and go okay i can see how he got here now you look at the sketches you look at the journals you look at the the early paintings of an artist and it helps you understand how he got how the artist got to how how he managed to create this masterpiece. That's what Fury wrote us to George Miller and his career. Um, but yeah, it's just I I I find it difficult, uh, and I including when I'm seeing it in the theater. I think I've watched the beginning to end without stopping five times now. This was my fourth time. And today was my fourth. I could still sit down right now and watch it again straight through. Have you watched it with subtitles? I have. That was what I did today. For the first time, I watched it with subtitles because that's one of the things that I wanted to touch on here in my first viewing experience was things are so chaotic and phrenic and their accent, not only they have really thick Australian accents, most of the characters, but they're also speaking nonsense 
dystopian gibberish. Right. So in addition yeah, to the fact that creates a jargon. In yeah, in, yeah, in addition to the fact that you have these engines going Wah! and you have these people with an Australian accent and they're speaking and gibberish. And, yeah, and they're speaking gibberish, it's really hard to pick up on the dialogue a lot of times. You get the point fit, you understand what they're doing, but you don't always understand what they're saying. I'm and that is the fact a, that they don't say a lot. So So that's what I was gonna say yeah. is the, the dialogue is actually really sparse. Mm -hmm. And so the thing you walk away from from your first experience was I just watched, and this is spoiler alert out the ass from here on out. If you haven't seen this spoiler film, spoiler alert. If you haven't seen this film, we're gonna ruin the rest of the movie for you. But I think that even if you haven't seen it, we're gonna paint such a vivid picture of it that go ahead and, and stay no, tuned no, in. Go ahead and stay tuned in and, and listen to what we have to say. So you walk out your first time and you go, I just watched a movie about a bunch of insane people at the end of the world driving from point A to point B and then saying desert. and then saying fuck it and driving back from point B to point A and that is the craziest fucking thing you could imagine and I, I went home going I just watched some motherfuckers get in a truck and drive to somewhere and go never mind let's go home and then they and then they do and then they just go home and and the, there's very little dialogue in the whole. Most of the, most of the movie is people going ah oh ah oh and blowing shit up and driving really really fast in the desert in, in vehicles that would that would kill any of us in modern in the modern world just by looking at them wrong. These vicious machines, these vicious people, and it literally is the story of let's go somewhere real quick and then fuck it, let's turn around and go home real quick as fast it's as we can. Trip. And it's a little bitty road trip. Like, <laughs> like how much distance do you think they really travel in the in the film? I mean, they're they, moving pretty fast, but I mean, you know, they drive for a day and a half basically. Yeah. They drive, go to and sleep, that means a couple stops. <laughs> they drive, they go to sleep, they get up and they drive again, <laughs> and yeah. they, they 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 get mo at most two and a half days of travel. So where they 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 probably could have maybe gotten five hundred miles the first day. And then yeah. turned around and did 500 back. So this is maybe a thousand mile road. This isn't even the distance from like the Midwest to LA and back. Right. This is just these people are so insane <laughs> that they make these little skirmishes like this all the time, yeah. and they just fucking die. They just they're gonna die from radiation poisoning anyway. Right. So so let, so I watched this movie a second time. Mm -hmm. And I get a little bit more of an understanding of what uh, of what so I'm So you seeing. saw it the first time in 3D, right? Yeah, I saw it every every time I saw it, I saw it in 3D. Uh, the first two times in 3D, then they re-released it in IMAX. Was that IMAX 3D or was it just regular? I don't recall. If, I don't if it was either. a re-release, it probably wasn't 3D. So they I would saw, have had the space so taken with some other 3D. Movie two, like the two times were 3D. Mm -hmm. The third time was IMAX, and the fourth time was just right here in my in my house with the subtitles on. Mm -hmm. So I was able to read all of the dialogue and see exactly what words were used and let me tell you that only enhances the experience to see the ridiculously crazy word salad things that have evolved from our culture because here's the thing about Mad Max Fury Road and the Mad Max films in general right. how much time would you predict happens between the gasoline shortage and nuclear war to when Fury Road happens how many years would you predict? Because we have no, no lot, we have no way of knowing. Right, we have no way of knowing. But Miller's actually said that uh, again, going back to Mel Gibson, a uh, part of the reason, and there's been a, there's, if you go out there and look, he's actually been much more vocal and open about the Mel Gibson concept of casting than than, than you would think. He at, at more than one stages said he didn't want Gibson; he was too old. And he wanted Max to be younger still. He wanted it still to be a contemporary Max. He didn't want this to feel like it was a way in the future. So, I mean, I don't think... Because I mean, here's the we thing. We don't know for sure. Because here's the thing. In this world, there is no way in the future. Right. These people are all this is it. radiation poisoned. This is live in the moment. Survive. They're insane. From They're dying from yeah. cancerous tumors all over their bodies. Mm -hmm. The even the drinking water they think is pure is most likely yeah, completely it's radiated. Yeah. It's most likely still completely radiated, mm -hmm. and they they are living literally moment to moment in this film in this world. And I imagine I mean all you have to eat uh, other than mom's milk. <laughs> Which we'll get into that, I'm sure. It's bugs and lizards. Bugs and lizards and each other. Yeah, I'm sure. Can, yeah, cannibalizing. Yeah, cannibalizing each other and just, just this is a world that's so utterly chaotic. Let's say Immortan Joe. Mm. Let's say he started his empire one year after the apocalypse. Let's, let's pause there for a second. Actually, I just want to ask you something about that. 
but it's something I always I still have trouble getting past because initially I thought it was just a typo, but it's like where do you why do you think uh, on a whim here why do you think they 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 went with the Morden Joe because it's word salad they've word forgotten salad. what the English language okay, even yeah, sounds like, like. That. it's that why they sense. use a lot of the words that they okay. use. Um, they it's it's clearly he's supposed to be named Immortal Joe, but they've right. forgotten what the word immortal okay. is, and Immortan is just what it's evolved into. It's what it's how societies uh, degrade well, over dialect. time. It's how it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's how it's how a, it's a it's a, a degrading dialect right. where they take contemporary words and just word salad them over time. And so if we if we are generous and say he's been in power. Uh, he, he, he took power one year after the nuclear attack on the world mm -hmm. and the apocalypse began. He's got war pups. Those war pups are at most eight years old. Right. We see them at the very end. got the war dogs that are like t late teens to mid-20s. A lot of the war boys are recruited. War boys, yeah. The war boys were recruited. Yeah. The war pups, my understanding of the war pups, is they're the ones that he's breeding in that um, hermetically sealed chamber with the right. uh, with the brides or whatever they're they're right, called with, his, um, breeders. with the breeder girls yeah. my my guess from because we don't learn any of this from the film this is right. one of the beautiful things about this world and we'll continue it together <laughs> we'll continue getting into this as we get through the movie is he gives us barely any dialogue to learn how the world is built we learn how the world's built through action through the visuals through looking at the backgrounds through looking at the things that are written on the walls through looking at the things that are branded onto the bodies of the characters and that's what he wanted that's what he wanted he wanted to tell the story visual he wanted the the images to tell the story he wanted a minimally he wanted minimal dialogue in the movie and i think that's one of the beautiful things about it because how many filmmakers could pull something like that off today so um what is the uh what is the dude's name the which big man, Rictus. Rictus if okay. Rictus is his real son, which he probably isn't. Right. Well, he is too. He's got the little deformed guy, and he's got Rictus. Right. They're probably not really his kids, but let's just assume that they were right. his kids before the apocalypse. Right. Because Rictus looks like he's about 30. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> And then, I mean, the other one's older. You can tell yeah. just looking at the face. So I'm assuming that they are not either not his real kids, or he already had them... But you know, I look the at the environment. I look at what clearly had been built up since the world fell apart. When you look at the contrivance, it's not even powered. It's it's human powered. All the gears, all the 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 lifts, and everything at the citadel. Could they have accomplished all that in a year? Not a year. Uh -huh. I'm saying the war pups. If oh, the war right, pups right. were bred in the hermetically sealed chamber, mm -hmm. then the pups are around eight years old. So I would yeah. give I would give it at best we are ten years out from the apocalypse mm -hmm. and everything is so fucked. All of those yeah. war boys have cancer. They call them all they they say they're at the end of their half life. Right. <laughs> because they're all completed in Valhalla. They're all uh, we'll get into that. We'll get into the <laughs> war boy cult um, stuff in a, as we get there right. in the in the as we start to go through the movie. But my my guess is my hunch has always been that this movie takes place about ten years out from the apocalypse and it's almost over. Yeah. We it's everyone is so insane and so crazy and so ate up with radiation that we might exist as a species on this planet for five more years. I mean, just look, maybe you, you look at the, the the masses that are under his thumb. They're dying. And just that's they're I mean, starved. Just, the dying. attention to detail in this film it's like you read so much visually. Yeah, I mean they're just they they're they're atrocious looking. Yeah, it sounds bad Hideous. to say this, but they just like you, toothless, they're, disgusting. They're, they're, they're one foot in the grave, and, absolutely, and, that, and that's being generous. Absolutely, you know? and once they're all gone, there's nothing. I've got guys with no legs crawling out of the sand because yeah. that's how they keep cool. They bury he buries they bury themselves, themselves in the, sand, in the fucking you know? sand. Yeah, their <laughs> their their skin is leather. They've been baked under the there. There's no. They don't even have shanty huts. No. They live under shield. They they're like wild animals. They, they have. They're like hermit crabs. They have yeah. like. They have like fucking uh, whatever scraps they could find. They build these sh giant body-sized shields that they crawl around under to keep the sun off of them. I mean, they're dying. And Immortan Joe, to the Immortan Joe has the, like really. It's kind of a brilliant idea. I'm gonna hermetically seal these women off into a room by themselves and keep well, them essentially a massive bank vault. Keep keep them away from the the radiation of this planet and try to have. And that's why later on in the movie they get so upset. 
that the baby was perfect in every way because that's what they've been trying yeah. to do with this Very hermetically sweet. sealed chamber was to create children that weren't uh, deformed or going to die of radiation poisoning with you know full of cancerous tumors and that was happening he was he was succeeding in his goal but since he was a a violent um, fascist dictator and these girls were literally slaves being held against their will he had the right idea for how to genetically how to continue right. the species but he wasn't doing it he was doing it with um without people's you know without their consent right, he was doing it against people's will yeah. so without jumping too far ahead i mean there's that that scene that we're talking about um you know where the child is born but you know is dead i guess we can say that um what leads up to that scene just perfectly illustrates how significant this is to everything as much as a scumbag he is to everything he's doing to his plans to what to where they're at as a species i mean it's so crucial this one unborn child I mean, just yeah, the actions he treats, that he Joe treats takes. It, yeah, he treats it like the most <laughs> like the most valuable commodity on the right. planet because he knows how close we are to extinction at this point. Exactly. So let's get into this fucking movie. All right, let's dig in. So I've I've, I've written down, given I've written notes scene by scene mm -hmm. for so so I gave the movie an A plus. Oh, absolutely. It was probably my favorite movie of 2014. It was my favorite movie of 2015. So blown away, completely exceeded expectations. Rarely ever happens with a film. So I went back like, to see it two more times. You went into it knowing it was going to be fun. You had that baseline. Based on that right. teaser trailer. Right. And, and the history of the franchise, too. Ah, uh, Still, I was doubtful. There's with a lot of franchise. the first one, with the exception of Mad Max, which runs a little slow, and for all intents and purposes, are, is a little different from the other three. But there's yeah. a lot of reboots that come back and yeah. suck. They come back and suck. It's just not the same magic isn't there. And th so I, I had my doubts. But... Mm -hmm. This exceeded expectations. Let's get into it. Now, a lot of the criticism surrounding this film when it came out was that um, these character motivations didn't make any sense. Why would these people drive off into the desert, f turn around and drive back? And why is this all just a movie with barely anybody says anything? They just hit each other a lot, uh, blow things up and just drive. It's like it was like people thought this is a dumb movie. It's dumb because there's not a lot to it. And there's, the only thing that there's not a lot to it is there's not a lot of things that are spelled out with dialogue, spoon-fed right. spoon to the audience. So a lot of people complain. And so the only, really the only thing you have to go off of is um, character motivation. Mm -hmm. You're seeing these characters act. They're, mm -hmm. they're making decisions, right? So we see these characters make a bunch of decisions and then the movie ends. Mm -hmm. And there's they hardly ever explain themselves. So the most criticism, so when this movie came out, it went. It was huge. It was number one in the box office the week it came out, right? Yes. And you have box box office numbers for that. I do. Um, opening weekend, uh, not a terrible number. Um, opening weekend it was about, a little over four, about forty five and a half million dollars opening weekend, which isn't is isn't great, but it's not bad for it's a movie super, that had a hundred million dollar budget. It's not a superhero movie huge, no. but it's uh, for a, a again a re a re a re whatever. Of right, a we're series the fourth movie in a franchise well, that, that comes know. out thirty years after the the outside last of Star Wars, Wars, what other movie can so you know? so it comes out opens very very well huge buzz huge buzz on the internet and um, almost everyone was saying how fun it was how they couldn't wait to go back and see it again mm -hmm. how many crazy fucking batshit insane things happen in this movie and then you started having these detractors mm -hmm. and some of my some of my close um, film buddies were saying that they hated the movie because the things the characters do don't make sense. And the reason I bring that up before we get into the movie mm -hmm. is I want to talk about literally the <laughs> first thing Max says. <laughs> so the movie opens with Mad Max taking a piss, mm -hmm. and he says, it was hard to know who was more crazy, me or everyone else. Well, then he hears voices. Then he stomps on and eats a lizard. <laughs> so let's go back one more time. Mm -hmm. The opening dialogue of the film. Which, by the way, is voiceover narration. He says, it was hard to know who was more crazy. Me or everyone else. And then he hears voices. <laughs> and then he eats a lizard. Not so, just eats a lizard. You have to be completely playing with your phone, staring off into space, or have already decided you're going to pick this movie apart and hate it to not pick up 
On the first line of dialogue, it was hard to know who was more crazy, me or everyone else. That sets up mm -hmm. the premise for the entire film of a bunch of characters making choices that make no sense because they're all insane. We're at and the brink of extinction right. on a planet that's been decimated by nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Don't fucking tell me about the minute decisions that you would make in an apocalyptic setting right. that you don't like that Max or Furiosa or Nux or Joe or any of the characters make in this film because the very first line of dialogue excuses every weird thing that's going to happen from beginning to end. It doesn't matter what they do or say because they're all insane. And then at that point, it's all about desperation and survival. So the thing that jumps out the most about this film to me, mm -hmm. we've touched on it a little bit as we're getting into the beginning here, is this, right. as this opening car chase happens and Max gets captured, is you see right away how dirty, nasty, rusted, and lived in this entire landscape is. It's just brutal. And it puts you right into this world in a way that, like, the Star Wars prequels, everything is so shiny and new, and it does. It looks like it just came out of the package. All the droids, all the landscapes, all the um, costumes that the uh, characters are wearing are all right out of the cellophane. <laughs> this movie, as soon as it opens, it just... Um, you can feel the grit in your teeth. You, yeah, start, it, you start just... Like, like when you had your mouth open when a big truck... And that's fine. You just got some of that dust in your. And head. that's what I mean when I say that um, that uh, th that it's like the Mad Max series under a microscope. Absolutely. It's like an HD. Like no matter where you look on this film, you pause your Blu-ray any on any scene, and you can spend ten minutes trying to piece together the history of of these characters, where they came from, who they were in a previous life, um, what the, how they built these contraptions that they used to try to kill each other with how the social structures have been created with the three communities Absolutely. that coexist within 500 miles of each other you know they actually communicate how they, how they, how they, they, they how they work with each other but then also there's tension they actually they live close enough together that they communicate by um, by shining mirrors mm -hmm. off the sunlight and looking through binoculars mm -hmm. each of the communities live close enough together that they can actually mirror signal each other mm -hmm. that there are going to be transports and trades mm -hmm. taking place so that's how tiny this universe is mm -hmm. and there's a point in the movie where they talk about they're going to drive 163 days straight forward through, through open desert. through open desert and and max Posits that well, you're not going to find anything but more desert <laughs> on the other side of 163 days of travel. So this, the, I mean, we are at the brink. I can't stress it enough. The brink of extinction. Yeah. This is the end of the world. So this movie starts with uh, Max getting chased very briefly. Um, he he gets uh, his car gets blown up. Is is a charger right? It flips over. Yeah, it's a charger right? It's I a, believe it's a charger. Yeah. yeah. So his beloved charger gets um, gets flipped. He gets captured. The charger gets taken into custody, and Max is then tattooed, has his back tattooed with his medical information. with all of his medical information on it. And then he gets sh uh, shipped off to the blood bank cages. Yeah. Now we don't learn any of this through dialogue. Mm -hmm. This is all just visual. We just see him getting tattooed. We see him getting shipped off, put in a cage, and um, and that's that. We have no idea what's happening. We just know Max is fucked at this point, right? right. <laughs> and then we, the next scene, we meet the Morton Joe. We see this guy getting um, put. He is a wheezing, old, tumorous. Your first image of him is, oh my God, who is this old, dying, decrepit man? And then they sort of his his Suit him up. slaves kind of put him in this crazy war suit where he literally, whether they were from his real life or just medals that he found and put, he's got this. Sort of like it was like this clear, clear like plastic body, like muscle casing, body casing right. to make him look and like then he's they put like the the embellishments which are like gears and things that are like or or ornamental embellishments and the, and then the best part is like the made either from human or animal teeth I can't tell but like the the face mask which you find out later down the road because they're very minimal with how much detail they show it's very much implied as they're suiting him up as I say. Uh, you find out later down right before well, well as he dies when Joe dies um, that's there's much more to that face mask than just being cosmetic 
Yeah, uh, he's literally built onto him, and right. he, uh, he, he, he he's very roughly almost a cyborg. Yeah, he's li- <laughs> this is his breathing apparatus, right. and it and it's very much fits into his mouth in a, in a such a way that we'll get into later. Um, thing very, very bad things happen when it's forcefully taken out of his mouth. Um, so we meet Immortan Joe, and he stands up and he gives uh, um, he gives a speech. Uh, you see sort of the people around him, the war boys. You see one of his sons is small, disfigured. You see his other son is big, giant, muscular, but clearly mentally retarded. Right. He's a, maybe he has the mentality of a 10-year-old and a gigantic, thick, muscular body. And the other kid is like just this squat little uh, thing that's got scars all over him from where you can see he's had many surgeries just to keep him alive. And, uh, and and Joe basically stands up in front of this crowd of, like we said, hermit crab people and uh, gives a speech about, oh, I'm going to give you a little bit of water, but listen, don't get yourself addicted to water because you get yourself addicted to water, it'll drive you crazy. But before he even gets to that, before that, what I find fascinating is he very much has an egomaniacal um, undercurrent to his thinking uh, to where I think on some level he believes his own mythology because before he even gets to the quip about getting addicted to the water he's talking about how he's the deliverer yes and 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 very this very like like uh messiah complex kind of a speech yes yet the beauty of the scene is you can look out in the crowd and the interactions of what little said but really just kind of the interactions and things and there's these two characters specifically you know this older man he's like oh, all he's focused on is the water they He's got a pair of binoculars. For, yeah, they don't buy it for a second. It's coming. They just know this is what they have to put up with to get the fucking water. <laughs> He's got binoculars. He goes, it's getting so it's coming. So really the only it's person that Joe is fooling is himself. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a very, very intricate hierarchy. Absolutely. It's painted very clearly, but again, with no words, really. He gives this small speech, and interspliced um, within this speech, you see this woman uh, with a shaved head and a mechanical arm um, she's getting into um, a big rig, and she's um, the war rig. The war rig, and she's uh, there. Might be a little dialogue here and there between a couple war boys, and it's uh, you. You also see at this point, I believe, uh, there's a, a cut a cutaway that shows the ladies that are having their milk. Um, well, the few sucked out few of there. Scenes where you see um, what do they call them? The, um They've got a term for it. And I'm Milkers? To, is that what they call? I think maybe. I think that something to that effect. And they're all they're all big voluptuous women. Big yeah. old titties. Oh, yeah. Big old big, big old, old rob, titties. Big old big old. Uh, the, the, our crumb, rubber crumb, would have been head over heels for all these women. Let me just put that way. So we, what we learn again through maybe a little bit of dialogue here and there is this uh, character, this shaved headed woman with the mechanical arm, is about to deliver some milk. On this war rig to Gasoline Town. Right, and they were gonna come back. Well, they call it Gasoline though. Yeah, Gasoline. Gasoline Town. Well, that's what they call. Right. Gas. Because again, that's right. the word salad. Right. Where they don't know. They don't know what gas is anymore. One they just the, know. One of the important, easily missed, uh, significant parts of this when we first meet Furiosa, and I guess an interesting correlation is, we don't really get a big picture view of the Citadel until we first meet her. Well, one of the things that I like about her is that from beginning to end, we don't know anything about her. No, we don't. Through a little bit of dialogue well, we, we later on, she tells us go, where she, yeah. she tells us where she's from, and that she got uh, captured and taken to the Citadel. Right. But we don't know how she worked up the ranks to becoming a uh, war rig driver or anything. We don't know how she. We don't ever well, learn how she lost left, her arm. You're left to imply all this, yeah. And, and to, and I don't know if you caught this or not, and I don't remember exactly where in the movie it was, but um, like the second or third viewing, I kind of started to piece together a theory in that she's tried some shit before and possibly that has something to do with how she lost her arm. I don't I can't think it could have been a, as a form because of punishment. It's like, it seems almost like when, when, um, and I don't remember his name, the little guy, the, the, the little deformed son. Yeah. I don't know when he what spots through the binoculars that she's off path or as they say, off road and she's not going where the intended target, the destination is. Um, and he, he points that out to Joe. Not for a split second is Joe surprised. He's just well, that's literally what happens next. Right. So we so we see Furiosa take off down the road. We see sort of the, the war boys. We see her caravan. We see mm-hmm. that she's got a couple of uh, motorcycles, mm-hmm. and she's got a couple of go-kart kind of cars, mm-hmm. and she's got this big-ass rig. And within a minute of her taking off, she cuts a right turn. 
and everybody's confused and hurt. The guy, the guy that's um, one guy comes up and says, "Hey, we're going the wrong way. What's going on?" Yeah, he's ru- he's running, kind of running the show. He's I don't know what you would call that, like the conductor. He's right, up there, right, kind of signaling to everybody and keeping the caravan intact. He drops down and says, uh, "Where, where, where we going? Where are we going to somewhere else?" And she says, "We're just headed. We're headed east." Right. And he says, "I'll tell everybody we're headed east." Yeah, but that's another crucial moment because it, 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 right there, it was very minimal, virtually zero dialogue. What you get from that, if you're really watching the movie, is the amount of um, trust on some level, but even not so much trust, but just the amount of authority and um, rank. She How clearly, she, got she it? clearly she out. Has. Yeah, she clearly he quite, like split second. Like, what's going on? Okay, I'm not going to So yeah, we have two story, things. We have two things that happen right, right here. And again, none of this is described with dialogue at all. Right. Is we see that uh, Furiosa outranks everyone in the caravan, and that, like you said, as soon and literally the next thing that happens is the little dude is following the caravan mm-hmm. on on his um, uh, on his um, uh, telescope. telescope yeah. And uh, as soon as Joe looks through, he says, uh, uh, "You know, something's wrong. They're off road." Mm-hmm. Um, as soon as he comes over and looks, he knows exactly what's happened. As though so, some like you said, on one level, she's the most high-ranking authority figure out of any of these war boys, mm-hmm. but at the same time, Joe knows he can't trust her. Perhaps because she's the only person that can do that job repeatedly and reliably, yet he knows there's something about her can't be trusted because what's the immediate next thing he does he is he ru- storms off directly to the hermetically sealed love nest. And he finds his breeders yep. are gone. Yep. And an old lady with a shotgun waiting to blow his head off. And he sounds the alarm, and this is where we meet Nux and the War Boys. And to me, this is where my favorite portions of this movie start to take shape. And so, my first viewing, I'm still just trying to get this this Joe character. I'm trying to get who's this Furiosa character? Where's Max? We saw Max for five seconds, and now we're at this citadel and these crab people and this water and the speech and everything and this big war rig. And so. He sounds the alarm, and we meet Nux and Split. Now, Nux and Split are two war boys who drive their own uh, war car, basically. Right. They get to be part of, I forget what they call the team, but a raid. they get to be part of a raiding party, right, basically. Right. And, um, and what we see right off the bat is Nux is dying. Yeah. And he gets As they hooked. say, he's running on low. He's running on low. And so what they're going to do is they, uh, they've they got Max hanging from a cage, mm-hmm. and they they call him a Max's blood bag. Max's blood bag, yeah. They call him a blood bag, and they hook Nux up. Mm-hmm. And so Split, who acts as Nux's lookout, the weapons guy that hangs out on the back of the car, mm-hmm. he basically, Nux is the driver, mm-hmm. uh, Split is sort of the, so Nux is the commander right. of the car, and then Split is the sort of navigator mm-hmm. slash weapons guy slash whatever else, mm-hmm. and as Nux is sitting there trying to get refilled with fresh Which blood. Which by blood bag, it's just the most rudimentary blood transfusion you can think of. So while he's getting Max's blood pumped into his body, Split rushes right past him when the uh, alarm is sounded, and he goes up to this shrine that they have, the shrine to the V8 God, <laughs> and it is full of oh, just, these it, de- just decorated, like badass looking decorated steering wheels. It's all steering wheels, and so how this culture works mm-hmm. is you can't drive a vehicle unless you have been you have appointed. Earn you wheel. earn your steering wheel, and then the, and you and that steering wheel is yours, and you have to hold on to it. And these vehicles don't it's move. Like earning your colors or so, your badge. You know? So Split runs past Nux and grabs his steering wheel. And he tries to take off without Nux, Nux realizing it. And <laughs> Nux trips him and is like, what the fuck are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm, you know, you're dying. You're dead. You're, my, you're, you're, you're as good as expired. And the blood transfusion bank guy is kind of you know, agreeing with him. He's like busting <laughs> Nux's balls going, you're, you're expired, boy. And uh, uh, Nux is going, fuck that. And he literally, I, I think I have Well, Nux his... and Split are both holding on to either end of the steering wheel. Yeah. They have a little tug of war of might. He's like, you're dying, man. You're almost dead. He's like, no, man. If I'm going out, well, this is exactly out, what he says. Yeah. I wrote, I, I, I wrote the quote here. He says, if I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die historic on the Fury Road. And so we get our title of the film, Absolutely. and uh, and we and as the and so Nux, uh, he almost gets passed over. But what he says, what he tells the blood bank uh, operator, is he says, uh, hitch him up. 
I'll take the blood bag with me. And holy shit, the next scene, we cut to, yeah, Max goes, what? And we cut to a scene, and they've got Max in a fucking, they've got him in a, uh, in a Hannibal Lecter face mask. Um, and they, they say they have it because he's, they say that he's rabid. He's a he's a rabid fight because he's a fighter. He won't every time they take him out of the cage, he clearly kicks everybody's ass and has fine. to get wrangled. So they so they muzzle him, mm-hmm. and they fucking tie him up, chain him up, and and put his hands behind his back, and they tie him to the front of uh, off the of like a pole, like a mask, off like a mask. Boat, now that's there. now that's not the first time they've done that in this Mad Max series. We see in Road Warrior where they take um, they take. Uh, characters and they stick them on. They actually have hostages right. from because the um, Road Warriors all a siege mm-hmm. uh, movie, all about these uh, raiders who are trying to siege a gasoline uh, a small little, little community they built yeah, up. Yeah, just a small walled enclosure that right. has uh, that has gas trucks in it. And we kind see of a them. Precursor for this. I yeah, think. well, there's a lot of, and I'll talk right. about that a lot yeah. as we get further into the movie. Is I really think that this is an unspoken remake of Road Warrior, but mm-hmm. not uh, directly. What it is is it's all of George Miller's best ideas that he put in Road Warrior with a budget and with today's technology. And so you see a lot of things overlap like that. Like, well, I tied people to a to a, a, a vehicle in Road Warrior, but I didn't get to do what I really wanted to do. What I really wanted to do was put them in a high chase, crazy And we'll, we'll scene. come back to this a little bit because it's important. And I have some sayings about that too, but... That's an important element for us to dwell on a little later is is the timing and how everything panned out. But um, so so we see these uh, we see we immediately see Mad Max fucking tied to the front of this thing. These vehicles are tearing off. We see everybody's vehicles. This is where we get introduced to a bunch of characters. But before we do that, the War Boys they yeah. they have this fucking chant. Mm-hmm. And they do this chant, and I didn't hear exact. I didn't know exactly what they were saying until I watched it with subtitles. They actually, the full name of these people are the Fukushima uh, Kamikaze War Boys. Or actually, I think they call themselves Kama Crazy. Mm-hmm. They don't call themselves Kamikaze. Mm-hmm. They call themselves Kama Crazy. So that they're the Fukushima Kama Crazy War Boys, and so they're chanting this at each other: Fukushima Kama Crazy, Fukushima Kama Crazy. And so, just in this scene where we see them suit up. We see Nux and, and Slice um, have and a fight. And then they got the, the, the like chrome spray paint. We haven't got there yet. Okay. We haven't got there yet. That's what. That's literally what's going to happen now. Right, right. Is we're 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 seeing this culture of these um, cancerous uh, uh, teenage men who are belong to this cult that Immortan Joe has created, and their entire purpose in life is to die as. Uh, big and um, impressive like, of a death, like the Norse or Viking kind of historical. And that they want a sense of dying a hero's or a warrior's death, and they want to die on the Fury Road, which is literally the road that connects all three, three of these three towns. Three, yeah. um, and they and and they have this whole mythology where they have this chant that um, I live, I die, I live again, shiny and chrome in the halls of Valhalla. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they so we so we keep we, we we now have the jig is up. Furios has been caught. Uh, Joe is in his own vehicle. Joe is in this big souped up. It's like three Pretty cars. Yeah, it's like a fifty seven Chevy. It's no, two fifty seven Chevys <laughs> piggybacked on double wide monster truck tires with all jacked up. Of, you know, it's killer. With yeah, at least like <laughs> six different exhausts coming Crazy. off of the thing. And that's how all these cars are. That's what I mean by if you pause this movie at any point, on any frame, you are going to see so much attention to detail. And you could there actually have been articles written just about the frames of cars welded together to create Immortan Joe's um, battle. Uh, I want to know, because you know, by the end of the film, Mortal J- Morton Joe's car survives. I want to know who owns that fucker. I'm, sure, I'm guessing Furiosa. I'm guessing it's Furiosa's car, but we'll we'll get into that as we keep going through the through the through the movie. Real so quick on the on the war on the war boys, um, it they're the only ones. I said before, Joe is only he's the only one believing his own mythology. But the, the war boys are the only ones that are they're hook line and sinker, and Nux especially. He is head over heels. He is fully committed 
Jesus. There's not a there's not a doubt in there's his mind. There's not a doubt in his mind, and that's important to remember. We'll talk about more as we go through the story. That's key to remember. In terms so of literally, the story arc in the film. Literally, as we're getting to know these, as we're seeing these mm-hmm. different vehicles, uh, Nux is able to pull up next to Joe's car, and he screams, "And more ten! And more ten! And and Joe kind of glances out of his car, and Nux literally flinches. It's like a celebrity. He sight. flinches and goes, "He looked at me! He looked at me!" And slices in the back, mm-hmm. busting his balls. Slices yeah, basically. Is it split? I thought, his name is his name is either split or sliced, but it has to do with the fact that his cheeks yeah, are split. Yeah, he's kind of got a joker thing going so on. So if it's, it's, if, if it's yeah. split, yeah, it is split. I've got it written down here. I've been calling him <laughs> Slice. His name's Split. Split is basically Mr. Hater. Through this whole movie, he's like he's down. Buzz he's kill. he's play, he play he he tries to player hate everybody in this fucking in this movie. So he's just busting up his balls, going, He was looking at your blood bag. He was scanning the horizon. Like he won't even give this guy he won't give this guy a second of a But he doesn't here. phase Nux. Nux is so, so we, deeply ingrained. Oh yeah, he fucking just laughs, kicks it into high gear. Oh, yeah. Busts off, and he just wants to. He wants to be the one to capture Furiosa. He's determined to be the hero of the story, he, yeah. not for himself, but for Joe, because he wants that immortality that yeah. he sees in Joe. Yeah. Because the Immorta are waiting at the gates of Valhalla forever, yeah. and so whatever the Immorta is. <laughs> but so this is. We also get introduced to another character uh, that blew up the internet became an internet sensation overnight from that teaser trailer is we come around and we start hearing we see these uh, war boys with a bunch of drums on the back of this giant truck and and then we hear and the the camera swoops around and there's a fucking guy girl and like this red no idea this this, this androgynous flowing robed character like with this headpiece mask thing with a mask that's covering his eyes and nose like his face has been completely disfigured he's blind uh, but he's got a double guitar that actually shoots flames out of out of it it's got exhaust on it and it's hooked up it's a flamethrower guitar and his whole point is to just be the war drums for dancing Joe's raiding as party he's dang, as he's hanging from multiple bungee cords he's hanging from bungee apparatus. cords so he's dancing on these like back and forth lunging back and forth and he's just playing music and this whole the whole point of this uh, is the tribal music truck this is what gets the war boys uh, hyped up and ready to die for Mort and Joe to be the comma crazy and do all the crazy stuff that they do so Joe knows his breeders are gone knows Furiosa has them it's taken off after him and Mad Max gets sucked right into the main storyline of this film through no actions of his own he was just trying to pee and eat lizards yeah from the very moment that he took a piss and ate his lizard and no point in that film was anything of his like he wanted nothing to do with that I'm not even supposed to be here today so the very next thing that happens as Joe's caravan is is trying to is Joe's war party is trying to catch up with Furiosa's the buzzards attack Furiosa and these things are these like crazy like what are those characters called in uh, in the Star Bucket? Wars oh um those characters in Star Wars are scavengers, and they were they're head to toe. Oh, yeah, yeah. They uh, capture the droids. Tuscan Raiders. The Tuscan Raiders. Raiders. Yeah, so yeah. these things very very closely resemble Tuscan Raiders, where they're completely right. they're 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 goggles, we're wearing gas yeah. masks, gas masks and goggles, completely um, draped in cloth, and their vehicles are just these rusted out, sp- full of uh, they're yes. like go karts full of full of spikes and shit. But they also have. Um, poles coming off of them mm-hmm. that have bombs attached to the poles right. and so these buzzards fly down um next to the uh, uh next to the war rig and um the war the war boys and the war rig are fighting them off they're mm-hmm. trying to blow up the war rig their uh, the war boys have their own war sticks right. which are basically these are basically like spears mm-hmm. these are basically like um th- this is almost like like the the story of uh, leonidas and thermopylae this is like uh <laughs> this is like the um this is like the Greek soldiers taking on the Persian army mm-hmm. where they're all fighting with swords and spears and arrows, except these guys are all fighting with boom sticks, basically bomb <laughs> sticks. And they basically hang, they're hanging off of their vehicles and they're dropped, they're th- sh- throwing these javelins with bombs on the end of them, blowing each other's cars up. And you are just seeing just bodies and exploding vehicles everywhere. There's this huge puff of smoke. And then this motherfucking truck with a fucking crane on the back mm-hmm. and a buzzsaw on the front <laughs> rolls up and it's got these wheel these uh, wheel spikes mm-hmm. it comes up next to the vehicle and is fucking trying to uh, to blow up the um, 
the the uh, the the war the war rig that Furios is driving. I mean, it, it's Road Warrior on to, on steroids. So they they're able to fend off the buzzards. Right. They're able to this big fucking machine that comes across and is trying to cut. It's got this big fucking buzz saw trying to cut through the war rig's um, uh, cab, the t- yeah. and they end up blow they end up blowing its um, its. Uh, uh, Hydraulics up, and they end up getting rid of this big giant truck and everything. And that's about the time that Joe's um, chase party catches up, and they kind of do away with the very last bit of the buzzards. And one of the things that happens, and this is where we get into the rest of the Warboy mythology with the spray paint, is um, is the, there's a car that drives up right next to Nux, mm-hmm. and Nux and this other car are dealing with a buzzard car right in front of them. And uh, or, or it's basically they're right behind a buzzard, and then right in front of the buzzard is the war rig. And mm-hmm. so this guy, le- this war boy, leans off the war rig, and he goes to throw a bomb at the buzzard. Mm-hmm. And the buzzard char- uh, uh, character in the buzzard car has a uh, has a hand um, crossbow, yeah. which we've seen. I think Max had one mm-hmm. in uh, one point, Road Warrior. Yeah. Um, and it sh- and they, this buzzard uh, guy shoots him and hits him in the face and chest and kills him and he sh- and he slumps over well, he's not, and then yeah. and then uh, the war boys all look at him and realize he's not dead he starts stirring and they're going get up get up get up and he leans up and he grabs his his uh, his bomb stick and they all and they all scream uh, scream do it do it and he grabs this thing attached to his hip mm-hmm. and it's a spray paint bottle and it's got chrome spray paint in it mm-hmm. he spray paints his own mouth and face and he screams witness me <laughs> and all the war boys around him scream witness all he, while he's got this crossbow bolt basically through his cheek from in one side of in the front of his head out the back yeah and in his chest <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah, he's yeah. De- he's done too, yeah. he's done for he's literally just <laughs> got enough strength. He dives off the war rig and he blows up the he drops into the car kamikaze style and blows up <laughs> the last style. blows up the last buzzard and and commits suicide mm-hmm. in order to 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 enter Martyrs the gates of because that's going to get him to Valhalla. That's what puts him in Valhalla and so everyone screams witness except except for Split who screams mediocre because he player hates everybody in this movie all the way to the end. Um, which 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 is a popular term, as we find out later, because Joe uses it. Well, I think that was the foreshadowing. Right. We get to hear that term <laughs> once. We only hear it once, and we hear Split say it. Yeah. He he screams mediocre at the at the character, while everybody else is celebrating his death because now he's entered right. the gates of Valhalla to live forever with the Immorta, whatever that is. <laughs> so this is pretty much solidifies the War Boys. That that pretty much tells the entire War Boy history and mythology of Everything their cult. Everything you need to know up to now. And we have had barely any dialogue between them. These things that they're screaming, witness me, mediocre, all these things are, again, the first time viewing, I'm like, I'm so overwhelmed because these aren't things you've ever heard before. Mm-hmm. These aren't terms that are taken out of pop culture and put into this movie. These mo- these terms are created specifically for this world. And so in the middle of these explosions and this high high intensity chase like we've literally talked about one thing this chick got into a car and drove and these other people are driving after her that's all that's happened in this movie and that's all that will happen in this yeah. movie so but the detail is so is, is so saturated that's why it, it, it needs multiple viewings so as this crazy scene with the war boys comes to an end uh, we see a giant dust storm ahead and Furiosa basically kicks it into high gear and says, we're going to lose him in the storm. And so all the war boys batten down the hatches. Uh, Nux uh, puts on his, uh, pulls his uh, fabric up over his face, and they drive directly into the dust. And that's where the war boy, the, 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 the main, like the front, the tip of the spear of mm-hmm. Immortan Joe's war party catches up, and all the war boys on the uh, tanker are fighting them off. And you ask yourself, wait a minute, they're all on the same team. Why are they fighting? <laughs> Right. That doesn't make any sense. What a bad movie. What Something's terrible up. writing. What terrible writing. No, it's because they're all crazy. Right. It's Go because these to people's the very first the very first line. The voiceover narration. And you'll see this happen so often that in the moment mm-hmm. these characters will decide to change allegiances mm-hmm. for no reason other than why not? Mm-hmm. Other than because we're crazy. And now things have changed. And now I'm going to be on this person's Team. And they go back and forth and back and forth. And it's not because it's bad writing. Mm-hmm. It's not because there wasn't forethought into it. It's because these people are insane. Mm-hmm. And how do you show insanity better than showing that these people have really no allegiance to anyone mm-hmm. at any given moment? That right. they can change on the drop of a dime. They can change who their friends are and who their foes are. How else would you 
I mean, we've said they're crazy. So at this point, the only thing they've shown that they're crazy is because these war boys will commit suicide. But so would Japanese bombers. Right. So would Japanese plane fighters. They weren't crazy. They were just uh, mil- they were in a, a indoctrinated into a military. Mm-hmm. These war boys are clearly indoctrinated into this military, but they're also all batshit crazy. So let's keep that in mind as the as the war boys <laughs> get caught up in this storm and there's a moment. Mm-hmm. And to me, this is the most important moment for Nux. Mm-hmm. It's how it's it's the beginning of his arc and where he will end up, he will end up there because of this moment. And what happens is he sees a car full of war boys explode, fly up, get caught up in the dust storm, mm-hmm. and there are explosions behind him that light them up. Their bodies fly, and it cuts to Nux, and he's looking up at them, wide-eyed, mm-hmm. with such reverence. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if he wishes he was one of those war right. boys that were dying in this battle, and he whispers to no one but himself, mm-hmm. witness. Mm-hmm. He is the wit- he wants to he wants he wants Valhalla to know right. that he witnessed these war boys Mm -hmm. death the only thing that matters to this character Nux Mm -hmm. and what's told in this scene right here is that someone witness his death witnessing death Mm -hmm. is the only thing that matters that's the key and that's going to be a big factor here Mm -hmm. later on in the film so I think it's a good moment to pause for a moment in the story progression and discuss something on the technical side as we as we get ready to go into this epic sandstorm because up until this point, and a lot of people are aware of this, but it's crucial to fully understand the achievement of this film. Up until this point, virtually everything we've seen has been done with practical real world effects. So this is another one of those this is another one of those things where the detractors, the people that just were looking for any reason to not like this because mm-hmm. this movie became so popular out of nowhere right. and there are certain um, you know, certain people like split in the real world that just have to player hate on anything that gets props that they don't think deserve props. And a lot of the reason they don't think it deserves props is because they didn't discover it first. This is how nerds are. This is how the nerdy uh, fan fanboy culture is. Fanboy culture uh, will get very upset if something gains popularity that they didn't put there. Right. They want to be the ones that found it first, and they want to be the ones that they put it out there. They it. want to have the credit for putting something out into pop culture. And Mad Max did it all on its own mm-hmm. just by being a crazy movie at the right time mm-hmm. for the right audience. And so the people that were player-hating it were like, while well, people like you and me were mm-hmm. praising all of these um, car stunts mm-hmm. being real vehicles that were hitting these ramps and blowing up and these real stuntmen that are being flung off of these vehicles and, and landing swing around on poles and but there's a small a small player hater audience going there's too much CGI in this film it's just a CGI fuck fest <laughs> I'm thinking to myself not one of these vehicles save once we hit this sandstorm mm-hmm. and these vehicles start getting whipped up into the storm those those <laughs> vehicles are the first vehicles in this whole fucking movie right. that are literally CGI creations the war boys flying out of the car are are CGI characters you can tell but what what a lot of these the the player haters were trying to do was talk about well it was shot against a green screen there there's some of these scenes are composited in it's like listen you can't control the landscape the weather where the sun's pointing and all they did was go out in the desert and build 20 foot high green screens that sat 20 foot off of the set mm-hmm. and then 20 foot or 40 foot high and spanned where the scene, you know, the, the length right. of the scene so that they could composite in the sandstorm, the, the sandstorm or the background, the, right. w- the way, the, the way they, way they wanted the sun right. to be aiming at the, at the, uh, at the vehicles and stuff. Mm-hmm. They, they were in the desert shooting mm-hmm. with real giant souped up yeah. Chevys built on top of Chevys with monster <laughs> truck <laughs> engines and monster truck tires and they were really flipping these things over oh. and having practical explosions happen on set and for even people the, even most of the explosions most of them uh, were, were were real were I mean, they tried to do as much as they could there was a few for safety reasons so I was scra- I was just scratching my head going why would people complain about the use of CGI in a in a 2015 film where about 80% of this stuff that's very complex, mm-hmm. very difficult, very expensive, very messy and very dangerous to human life. They don't have to do that. Yeah. Most movies in a day and age where movies as a default go to CGI and in most cases at best are just okay. 
So yeah, I, I, I give it props for, for its use of, for George Miller going old school mm -hmm. and doing most of his stuff as, as in this huge, complex, complicated, mm -hmm. giant car chase movie <laughs> um, as practical effects. But there is a small contingent of player haters out there that'll tell you, no, 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 too much CGI, bruh. I wanted, to, I wanted it to be like, you know, I don't know what they wanted it to be like. I don't know what they expect. They just, they wanted to find it first. Yeah. Is what it is. They're just upset they didn't find it first. So, are we moving forward? Yeah, let's move forward. I just wanted to put a light on. That. So, this is probably my favorite scene in the film. It comes up next. The uh, the Nux and Nux decides this is his moment. He he pulls his nitrous and his gas lines. He fills his car up with gasoline. He lights a flare. He gets right up next to Furiosa's war machine, and he's gonna blow himself up, blow up the damn war machine blow up everybody for a Morton Joe and, and then right at the last second <laughs> Max is able to grab his grab his hand because by this time Max has gotten loose from the from the pole in the front he's, he's kicked just got his muzzle still. he's kicked Splice off he's got his muzzle but he's still chained right. we haven't talked about this Nux actually handcuffed Max to a chain that right. runs and is handcuffed to Nux right. so they're handcuffed Long together chain, yeah. by about a 10 or 12 foot of chain yeah. And uh, Max is able to grab. He, he was in the back fighting with uh, with Split. Kicks mm -hmm. Split off the vehicle. Mm -hmm. He's able to crawl back in just in time to grab Nux's hand, st uh, stop him from um, from putting the flare into the gasoline nitri nitrous mix, and yeah, grabs the, the grabs the that, steering yeah. wheel and wrecks the vehicle. Throws mm -hmm. the flare into the air, wrecks everything, st mm -hmm. and and then the and then the camera actually rests on the flare as the dust storm kicks up mm -hmm. and it and it and it fades the um, the flare out. Mm. This is literally the first moment of this movie we've taken a breath. Mm -hmm. This and is the first breath. It's the first of multiple disappointments for Nux. <laughs> <laughs> so the camera fades back in. This breath is very, very brief. This breath lasts for about 10 seconds. Camera fades back in. Max pulls himself up out of the dirt. And he looks around, he's disoriented. And he sees Nux's body, mm -hmm. and he sees a shotgun. Mm -hmm. He picks up the shotgun, loads it, walks over, pulls Nux's arm up, puts the shotgun on Nux's hand. He's getting ready to blow it off. And then I forget why, but for some reason he decides not to do that. Maybe he pulls the trigger and nothing happens. That's what it is. He pulls the trigger the and nothing. Sand had gotten into the shotgun. He pulls the trigger and nothing fresh, happens. Yeah. So he picks Nux's body up, throws it over his... Which again... We're going to come back to this in a second. It's an important visual cue. So at this point, Nux is wearing his boots and he's wearing his jacket. Right. Mad Max's jacket. Right. So he picks him up, throws Nux over his body, and takes off walking. And the storm's gone. When he right. wakes up, the storm has passed. And he takes off walking. And within a couple of minutes, he runs into Furious's war rig. And now all of the breeders are out. They've got a hose hooked up and they're taking a bath. They're, wa they're washing all the dust storm off of them. And Furiosa's kicked back. She's got her arm off. She's knocking um, dust out of the mm. the breathers of her of her war rig, and they're basically trying to get this thing road ready again after being stranded right. in a storm. Because you can't drive a vehicle through a storm; all the stuff gets clogged up, right. and the engine's going to die. So they're clearing everything out, and Max walks up with Nux on his back and the shotgun. <laughs> and uh, we're not going to go over every single thing that happens, but right. basically, what ensues is this dialogueless battle mm. between Mad Max. Nux, who wakes up, mm -hmm. Furiosa, and all the breeders <laughs> as they fight over the shotgun that Max knows doesn't work. Right. <laughs> but he's menacing them with it. He's right. asking them for water, telling them he's going to steal the rig. Nux wakes up. Nux is somehow now on Mad Max's side. Because again, the allegiance <laughs> well, is. Nux thinks. Oh, Nux is like, this is it. Yeah. This, this is go about to begin to be, be the beginning of his second disappointment in that he thinks, this is my end. This is how I'm good with Joe. So he immediately he makes it. You're helping me. You're yeah. with credit too. He makes an unspoken alliance with right. Max because he thinks Max is trying to take out Furiosa, even though it would make no sense for him to do so <laughs> because he has no beef with Furiosa. He's a slave. He's a right. blood slave, and they're literally going to bleed him out until he but dies. That's how blinded Nux is with his... For lack of better words, his fate. And um, also just how crazy all these characters exactly, are. Exactly, right. So they get into this fucking fight, and it's awesome. Because for a while, Nux is still passed out. And so Furiosa has one arm, and she's fighting Max, <laughs> who's got a muzzle on. He's attached to and a it's body. one arm, because the other one's attached to Nux. He's attached to a body, <laughs> and, he's, and they're fighting over a shotgun that doesn't work. 
Furiosa eventually gets the shot, and and so the the breeders are gra- they they're grabbing the chain, mm-hmm. trying to yank. So so Max is trying to fight this girl. Mm-hmm. These other girls are yanking it back down on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, they're fighting over the shotgun. Eventually, Furiosa grabs the shotgun, puts it up to to uh, Max's throat, and like a mm-hmm. G, doesn't even hesitate, pulls the trigger. Miss She's fire. ready to blow his head off without hesitation. Yet but another... for a split second, then you see the look on Max's face. He's not one hundred percent sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that goes. I think that goes a long way towards explaining again, giving a little more flavor and a little, little more depth into Furiosa's character. She has absolutely no she qualms with killing anybody that gets in her way to achieve her goal. Mm-hmm. And as we learn here, as this, um, so so so. Uh, one of the things we also learn, like right when they get right when he walks up with the shotgun, is we see these these beautiful girls. One of them is fully pregnant, mm-hmm. absolute gorgeous um, woman, but she's got scars all down the side of uh, one side of her face. And so again, this adds so much flavor mm-hmm. and depth. Like, why has she been branded in her face? She's got such a beautiful face. Yeah, it's, it's not so they're so shiny and they're so so chrome. There's yeah, the, none of the they, other. They look out of place. They're like supermodels. None of the other girls have any scars on them, and this is who Immortan Joe. What is her name? Um, I have her name written down here at some point. Um, doesn't matter what her name yeah. is, but um, she um, is that the splendid, splendid, Ang- or something. Yeah, like splendid. Sp- sure, splendid yeah. is her name, and so she. We find out. Through another scene or something, that she is Joe's favorite. Right now, is he been carving up her face while getting her pregnant? Because she's the one that's mo- that? she's like leading this like fuck no, we're not going back, right. we'll never go back party. And I think it might have something to do with the fact that Joe likes to play tic tac toe on her face. That or maybe she's attempted something in the past, and that's just a result. But but yeah, basically it doesn't. It doesn't make sense if everything's peachy keen that the beauty is surrounded by 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 ugly. It, it is marred up. It's like ironic, and it, so there's something you, you know something's not right. They're trying to escape, and that's just another one of those visual cues that just adds so much depth and richness to this film that the that the detractors of the film just seem to glaze right over and not even. And, and again, it's because they, they never ex- express, express or explain it. There's no flashback or backstory or dialogue or, or any kind of um, uh, attempt to explain it. It's just there for you to pick up on if you see it. If you don't see it, you miss it. Um, on that note, though, I want to back up for a second just briefly about something. It's it's a relatively insignificant thing. It's just a shot. And you, and you, you mentioned it, but just in passing. And for me, anyway, it's, it's one of the shots that stuck with me more than anything is when Right after they crash, and you know, when you talk about, you know, Max gets up out of the dirt, out of the sand, right? It's so much more than that. That one shot, because if you remember, if you if you picture it, when you see that shot initially, you don't know it's Max, because the way Miller has so brilliantly framed it and chose to depict it, it looks like a landscape shot in the distance. Yeah, it looks like a mountain. Right. It just looks like a dune, another dune out in the distance, and not until he begins to come to consciousness. And move, you see some of the sand move, and then you see him kind of, not in slow motion, but kind of slowly emerge from this dune, like he's, like he's larger than life, like he's a giant well, out of the earth. Let's talk about motion for a second, because okay. what one of the things that Miller does here so brilliantly is something that he did with his earlier Mad Max series, and that's at any given point, at any given time, if he wanted to up the action, he would speed up the yeah. film. The feed would speed it up two, two or three times so that it's it's almost working in in fast motion. And like you, you fast forward. Especially forwarded. notice that in in the in the foot chase scene after he escapes and he's and he's being chased through the subterranean tunnels of the Citadel. Yeah. And it's it's really it, it's unnerving the yeah. effect it has, which is great because because he's, you can tell Mad Max is is like I'm running for my life. I don't know I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where. And I'm these going. war boys pounce on him. and He gets yeah. yanked, and it's all this stuff is happening at a hyper fast. It's almost moment. like a strobe light effect. Yes. Without there being strobe lights, yes. it's done with action and motion. And Miller had done that before with the other Mad Max movies, so that's a trick that he brought back to it, and it works brilliantly in this world Amazing. for whatever reason. So, uh, so Max. Uh, he's able to get another gun, mm-hmm. and he's able to. Um, it's a handgun. He, he's able, he's able to get a hold of Furiosa. Mm-hmm. Um, he's able to get Nux to cut the. He's finally cut free of Nux, right. so now it's no longer fighting with attached to another character. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he's got this gun trained on Furiosa, and he basically mm-hmm. just says, "Let me go." So right. he gets in the war rig, and everybody's like, "What are you doing?" And uh, and you hear 
but you hear the Doof Warrior mm. in the distance. Da 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 and you see on the horizon that Immortan Joe's raiding party is getting close. Mm-hmm. They're still in the, off in the distance, but getting closer. And Furiosa looks at him, and she says one of my favorite lines of the movie, you're sitting on 2,000 horsepower of nitro-boosted war machine. I'd say you got about a two-minute head start. <laughs> and so Max takes off in the war rig, but, but Furiosa has it all... Um, She's got it yeah, all kill rigged. Switch. She's got kill switch. switches, yeah. so it won't won't run without her. She basically tells all the other characters, "Get your shit and let's go." Mm-hmm. And uh, and you know, of course, Max is stranded a few feet up. Right. They get into a, they get into a little bit of a verbal sparring match, and then again, these weird allegiances that <laughs> form out of nowhere for right. no good logical reason that the detractors of the film say is bad writing. It's just crazy people that have no choice but to make these. So I was just shooting what at else your is head. Happen? I was just shooting at your head two minutes ago and was going to kill it. this girl. Literally had. A shotgun up to his throat and pulled the trigger click <laughs> and is now pleading with him let's be buddies I can drive this thing I'll take you and she even says do you want to get that thing off your face yeah. and so she's trying to build incentives for Max mm-hmm. to trust her even though she tried to blow his face off well and an important thing that she brings up too that she mentions that we that we that we passed over something she said to Max is like you're putting a lot of faith in someone who when when you just damaged his favorite breeder. Yeah, so one of the yeah. bullets ends up uh, grazing uh, her. Grazing what is her name the leg, again? I think. Um, the 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 um, splendid. She ends up yeah um, grazing splendid, and so now mm-hmm. she's going to be nicked, has a scar mm-hmm. that wasn't inflicted by Joe. Right. So so literally the 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 uh, the dialogue is you're putting your faith in a very bad man, mm-hmm. and um, so Joe's or so Max is like yeah fuck it come on. First he's like, you can come. Then she's like, well, I'm not going anywhere without them. Mm-hmm. And so they all get on board. And I believe at this point, Nux is still like... Yeah, he's just coming to it, I think, or something. No, no, he's up no, and walking around. Yeah. And I think he's just like, cool, let's go do it. He's, right. Literally, he's crazy. He's, he's, he's <laughs> a, a, aligned with no one at this point. Right. He's just in it for himself. He's so um, crazy and just yeah. into the moment that he just wants this to just happen. Right. He just wants to be able to be a part of this thing. So... So another thing that, that happens right away that I think is a great touch is Max starts grabbing all of the um, hidden weapons mm-hmm. all throughout the cab of this vehicle. And Furiosa's probably got 10, 12 guns hidden. And he's got the uh, he's got the breeders. He's like, give me that one, give me that one, give me that one. He's reaching up, <laughs> grabbing one out of here, reaching under the seat. Even to the point where later on you see she, the, the stick shift is, is actually made uh, a hidden knife. You done pl- played me again. I was going to get to that. <laughs> I was gonna get to that. Fireman. So they put all the they put all the weapons in a bag, and he's got all the he's got all the uh, the, the guns in a bag, and he's holding on to them. So right. he's got all the weapons. Mm-hmm. He's still got the gun trained on Furiosa. Mm-hmm. All the um, uh, the breeders are in the back, and uh, and he's he's all good to go. At, at one point, like you said, he he leaves the cab for some reason, and Furiosa reaches over, and she's like the shifter pulls it up, and she's got a knife in there. And it's like there's just no shortage of violent killing things in this vehicle because. These characters in this world, at the brink of extinction, fight for their lives mm-hmm. every single moment. So, um, yeah, they try. The, the 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 girls don't want um, they don't want Nux to come with them. They actually kick right. him. He's trying to climb up with them, and they kick him out. And um, one of the things the girl, one of the girls screams. And again, this is something I didn't pick up on until I was watching it with subtitles later. Is she actually screams at him? He's a crazy smeg who eats schlinger, whatever the fuck a schmeg is, and Doesn't whatever the fuck a, whatever the fuck a schlinger is. These are very bad things. These are very heavy insults coming from the breeders, and that's just again just building the dialogue or building. You don't need the, to know what it is. You fill in the blank. Yeah, it's, it's building the the sort of cadence of this culture. And the dialogue of, of the dialect of this culture, um, and they go—they don't try to explain it to you at all. You are a helpless witness of the end of the world, mm-hmm. and um, so. Uh, so at this point, the other the other towns join, and as they're driving off, trying to get away from uh, from the Morton Joe's raiding party, they see another raiding party. They see it coming from Guzzoline Town or Gas Town, as they right. call it. And the 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 dial the the. But then the other one is just because we haven't touched on the other one, it's Bullet Farm. I, play it, playing me out again, brother. <laughs> playing me out again. So uh, so they 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 have their own uh, telescope mm-hmm. and they look or binoculars or something and the and the breeders look out and they have another piece of nice flavor dialogue that just mm-hmm. fills in just colors in this world 
where uh, she says, uh, Big rigs, polecats, flamers, and the people eater himself come in to count the cost. And so what this is, is this character, this people eater, as they call him, is the uh, the leader of Gastown, is like this huge, hideous, fat guy. He's got like the worst case of gout you've ever seen. And his feet, and, his, <laughs> and he's got a metal nose that's yeah. almost like... It's almost like um, um, Miller was like, uh, "Let's have him. I want. I want him to have a nose ring. I want him to have um, mm-hmm. chains that go from his earrings to his nose." Mm-hmm. But then, instead of a nose ring, they just built him a brass nose. Well, I think it's like I think because, well, it wasn't there at some point a moment where it's not there. Like I think it's like a, it, like he doesn't have a nose. It's yeah, like, it's almost it's, like syphilis. Syphilis, syphilis has eaten his nose <laughs> away. And he's got this prosthetic brass nose that sits on his. Like right. Almost like a pair of uh, bifocals right. that sits on a chain, and he's basically he records the cost of all the bullets, all the gasoline, all the vehicles, and all the the war boys. Mm-hmm. He's basically the um, what would you call that? The uh, he's the, the bookkeeper. Uh, yeah, he's the bookkeeper of this well, crazy. And, 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 and at one point he says it's, it's a whole lot of cost for a family squabble. A whole lot of cost for a family <laughs> squabble. He says. And, uh, and and so he's basically the bookkeeper of yeah this tri city right. area uh, this tri city area at the brink of the end of the world, and uh, so he's coming now. The people eater mm-hmm. is on his way down, and um, and and Max gets out and he's he goes up to the top for some reason. Oh, Nux at this point hasn't Nux. Um, he jumped on the back of the rig and yeah. he's and he locked up the uh, little uh, fuel pod they had on the back. So Max gets out and he's still working. He's had this file, his file on the back of his going. neck to get this the harness off his right. face. He's had this harness on his face this whole the whole movie. And so he gets out to go see what's happening. He figures it out and as he's crawling back. Uh, Nux sort of has done that as a distraction so he can climb up and he gets and in. That's how he finds out that there's a way in. Yeah, that's how he finds finds that little thing, and then he's able to. Um, he, he, uh, Nux is able to get in with the girls. They just yell at him and kick him out of the vehicle, knock him off one more time, and right. he like pulls a he like rips one of their dresses off, so he has proof to show a Morton Joe that he was on the rig. He's got the he's got the the material, and Max finally, as he's walking back after plugging replugging in the hydraulics for the um, fuel pod, mm-hmm. he's still working with the fucking. Uh, uh, Which the whole the whole the whole thing behind that is the fuel pod was dry. They were dragging the fuel pod behind them because it wasn't it wasn't it, the wheels weren't turning, so it was slowing them down. And that was Nux. Right. He created the distraction right. so he could get up there with right. the girls. They kick him off, and then as as Max is walking back, he's still working with the file. And then you hear click, and I actually wrote it down at forty five minutes thirty seven seconds of this film, mm-hmm. Max finally freezes face, and we finally see Tom Hardy right. um, full full face on. I mean, we saw him a little bit at the very beginning right. when he was getting captured, but for basically for all intents and purposes, for the first forty five minutes of this film, Mad Max is stuck inside of a face cage which is sort of brilliant um if you're trying to continue a franchise but re uh, but recast the character recast the actor it's it's almost you like ease the audience into that transition yeah it's almost like it could have been anybody because at this point you don't care <laughs> yeah uh, that it's somebody else <laughs> right it's just because this movie is so crazy and it's clearly not about max max is just stuck in the middle of this whole thing and he's just trying to survive so that's it. At 45 minutes, 37 seconds, we finally see Mad Max. He gets back, um, he, he gets back into the, uh, the cab, and this is the crucial moment of the movie where they get to the pass. Now, Furiosa has made a deal with the raiders of the pass or the keepers of the pass. They don't really um, give a name for the people who live there, but they're basically these people on dirt bikes. Well, what they call, well they call them many mothers. No, no, no. You're again play, you're playing me way before we get to. I'm oh, talking about okay. the people who live in the pass. Oh, oh, I got you. Okay. That yeah, Furiosa yeah, got makes you. the uh, she makes the, uh, the deal makes with. The deal with who we're supposed to get the fuel. She's pod. dropping yeah. the fuel pod off to these characters that right. ride these dirt bikes, and they aren't. I don't think they're named. I didn't catch it at least, and I've seen the movie. No, four, I've like seen the movie four games. times, and yeah. I haven't and I haven't uh, picked up on their names. So she's basically like everybody has to hide, but I need you because if shit goes south right now, I need you to drive the rig. So she right. teaches him the kill switch sequence, mm-hmm. and basically says, "When I yell your name, what's your name?" And he just says, "He doesn't say anything." Yeah. What's it matter? She says, "What difference does it make?" She's like, "Well, I'll call you fool." So when I yell fool, <laughs> um, drive the rig, and so shit does go south. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, they do start shooting at her uh, because they see uh, Morton Joe's and all three. Yeah. They she see all. Come along. They see the Tri City fucking right. Raiders exactly up her of what the deal was. up her <laughs> ass, and she and they and she, they literally yell down to her. You said you might have a few pursuit vehicles. I see three raiding parties, and that's when they just are like, "Fuck it, kill her!" And so they start shooting at her. She yells, "Fool!" She jumps back on the rig. Uh, uh, um, Max takes off. The, the keepers of the pass blow the pass mm-hmm. and so all the all the war parties get caught mm-hmm. and Joe basically Joe and um, what is his name the, the, the big, big stupid guy yeah. um, I forget what his name is again Rick Rictus, Rictus yeah. uh, so Joe Rictus and a couple war boys get on this uh, they get out of the main vehicle and they get onto this huge monster truck <laughs> mm-hmm. with these giant wheels and they basically crawl well, over Joe's, isn't it? no Joe's is a, has Monster truck tires, but they're smaller. The one oh, they no, get on right. just has these giant right. off-road. Right. They switch vehicles, and they Joe basically yells back, clear these rocks and bring the rest of the war party through. Right. And so it's just Joe in pursuit <laughs> of Furiosa and Max, who have this right. new uneasy alliance. <laughs> Nux uh, gets on the car with them. Mm-hmm. That's the scene where, right, as they're getting ready to crawl up the rocks, uh, one of the war boys runs up and says, this, this one says he was on the war rig. And Joe says... Let him come, and he gets this crazy look on his face, like, "Oh my God, I get to ride in a fucking car with a Morton Joe!" Like this is right. Nux's, and he even says, "What? What? A, what is it? What is the line? What a wonderful day!" What does he say? Something like that. Yeah, he is just loving this. Thing. Oh, he's like, "Well, once again, this is setting up. This is setting us up where Nux is. You know, this is yet another opportunity for Nux, because from here he, he tells Joe, "Hey, you get me up there." Get me out of there. I know a way in. He does. He says, I know if you can get me up there, I'll st-. Well, this is literally what happens next as Travis continues to play me as I try to walk <laughs> us through. Up to speed, man. <laughs> so another battle ensues as a Morton Joe takes a monster truck over the, the blown up pass. These are my notes. I'm just reading them out loud. Um, yeah. So this is the moment. I mean, so Joe, Joe, even, Joe even gives him his like chrome plate. Stop. <laughs> You're playing me. That's literally what's next. <laughs> So this is it. So Nux is in the car with Joe. Joe's driving the car. He gets it right up next to the uh, to the war rig, and he gives uh, Nux a speech. He hands him a gun. He gets Joe's own gun. He hands it to him, and he says, "If you do this, you will. Ri- uh, I will personally escort you to the halls of Valhalla." And he says, "You will ride eternal, shiny and chrome." And Nux says, "Yes." And he jumps onto the vehicle, and he gets on top of it, and he takes off running, and the 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 blood bag chain is still trailing behind him. It gets caught. He fucking stumbles. The gun goes flying. And Morton Jones own uh, Morton Jones' own personal gun is gone. And Nux falls down. He's hanging off the edge of the other side of the board. And Joe ring. and Joe and Joe says the word. He says "da mediocre" and, then and drives off. off. Nux just drives off. Now it, you know it's just the classic. You know, Jack Nicholson's Joker said it. So many villains said it. It's like, you got. You want something done? You got to do it yourself. He doesn't say it, but yeah. his actions say it. So Nux is devastated. Mm-hmm. He had three opportunities at this point to enter the gates of Valhalla, mm-hmm. to to capture uh, Furiosa and be the best, be a celebrated hero for all eternity in the War Boy mythology. Mm-hmm. And the look on his face, he's so embarrassed. He's, he's so crushed. And so again, his allegiances are about to change because he will never be able to face Morton Joe ever again after being doing something so stupid right in his face <laughs> and having Morton Joe himself witness his mediocre right. behavior. Because if 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 being witnessed uh, sacrificing yourself for uh, for for Joe or for the cause or whatever right, right. is the best thing that could happen to you. The worst thing that can happen is to be called mediocre. Right, and uh, by Joe himself. <laughs> and so, um, so at this point, another really cool, flavorful thing happens um, as they're driving. Rictus, uh, as they pull up next to the war rig, Rictus shoots one of those harpoons mm-hmm. into the cab of the this war rig and yanks <laughs> it off. And the and rips the steering wheel out of the war rig, and so the war rig is just just <laughs> careening around inside this gorge. But Furiosa's no pushover; she's a hard ass. What does she do? So Furiosa <laughs> grabs a bunch of rags and a sawed-off shotgun and creates a steering wheel 
out. Oh, no, not a shotgun. Mo- a big ass fucking pipe wrench. Is it a pipe wrench? Yeah, I thought it was a. Fucking, I thought it was no, a pipe she wrench. She puts and it a... on the steering column, tightens it down, and then she takes the rags and wraps it around the handle because it's going to be hard to steer with this. I thought she, had, in addition to that, added a sawed-off shotgun as an extension, maybe. But what yeah. connected to the steering column yeah. was actually a big ass pipe wrench. Yeah, so she's got yeah. a pipe wrench, yeah. and then the pipe wrench is is uh, grafted onto a or, or barely held the in place with the worthless shotgun. With the worthless <laughs> shotgun. And, uh, and it's all held in place with rags. And so they are steering this war rig. Her and Max together. Together to are steering this, this fucking war rig uh, because they no longer have a steering wheel. Again, that is just one of these things in an action movie where if you're going to have a movie that's almost all action and not dialogue, these little things that happen are what make the movie so goddamn good Otherwise, and so it's goddamn flavorful. People driving it's, the these, it's, these, <laughs> it's these micro... Um, uh, climaxes that happen. It's these scenes with these micro conflicts where boom, I harpooned you, bitch. Boom, I ripped your steering wheel, steering wheel out. You're done. And they have to, in the moment, try to jury rig this fucking vehicle to keep going so they don't get caught. And it's little things like this that have just been happening throughout the whole movie that build this, another, this another. flavor. And it's just so, like I said, it's like Mad Max under a microscope. <laughs> Mad Max in high definition because the other movies are good, but the other movies don't have, and maybe um, Beyond Thunderdome. Um, made a concerted effort to have these type these little flavor moments, but all in all, the story of we'll get into that. Maybe not yeah. in this podcast because what, what this movie had that none of the other three, uh, um, whether they aspired to be or not, none of the other three had that this movie has uh, in just endless amounts of is the energy. Yes, it it's never just a pure like adrenaline action movie from beginning to end. So, all this craziness is happening, and Splendid falls out of the car, and she's barely hanging on by the door. The door door rips off, and she goes under the wheels of a Morton Joe's vehicle, and the other girls are all crying. We have to stop. She almost falls, and they they don't just they don't just you know blow they don't just throw her off. Yeah, they fuck with you some more before it happens. So. so she she goes under the wheels and the and the girls are crying saying we have to go back and and, uh, uh, and Max this is, is this going. This is where Joe shows how important she is because to avoid running over her he trashes and flips his he flips the killer mon- monster car he flips the monster truck to try to avoid it which by the way his his bigger son Rictus is on it so potentially <laughs> killing him yeah, and just, himself as long as the as long as the baby in right. in, in um, in a splendid stomach survives, he's willing to sacrifice everything, Absolutely. including letting Furiosa go. So, so this happens, and uh, and then the sun the sun falls. So the end of the first day. Mm-hmm. Um, this is where the movie starts to slow down. And if there's any criticism I have of this film, it's that about the next fifteen or twenty minutes takes a long time to get up and get going again. But think about but it feels how okay though. Think about how long we've been talking. Mm-hmm. And how much has happened, and how little break there's been in any action at all. There was that one moment where the du- the, the 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 dust storm puts out the flare, mm-hmm. and Max gets up, and that's about a ten second lull. Right. That's a tiny little break where where the movie breathes. This here is where the movie catches its breath. Right. This is the only time in this entire film that things slow down, and they slow Which down. This happens to be the only point in the film where it's night. Um. And, and so the, the war rig is, is just steadily uh, barreling down the road in the night. One of the, one of the girls, the red-headed girl, I didn't catch her name. Did you, do you have her name written down? I got almost everybody's name but the redhead. The redhead finds uh, Nux cradled in a, in a seat on the war rig. Mm-hmm. And he's just depressed, crying, ready to give up on life because of what's happened. He's embarrassed himself in front of Joe. And he says... Uh, he talks about um, McFeasting with the Immorta in Valhalla. He said, I've had three chances. I should be McFeasting with the Immorta in Valhalla right now. And she says, well, maybe it was your manifest destiny not to. It's just this <laughs> nonsense dialogue. Again, these word salads that don't make any sense uh, to anybody. Like they but... just find bits and pieces of recorded dialogue in some form, and they just create a new language. Whole new dialect. Whole yeah. new, whole new uh, dialect. So night falls. Uh, they end up in a swamp, and they and all the vehicles are getting stuck in the mud. Nobody can 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 move. The war rig itself gets stuck. They have to. They they're 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 in the middle of this crazy pursuit where the bullet factory character. Do you remember what his name is? Um, 
I remember the guy that played him. It's not him, but it was initially it made me think it was Billy Connolly. Um, I'll have it here in a second. Keep talking. So the the bullet farmer uh, leader basically. No, that was his name. The bullet farmer. Yeah. So the yeah. bullet farmer leader, um, he basically has the only vehicle that's on treads. Mm-hmm. He's basically got a convertible that's got instead of wheels, it's got treads. So he just takes off ahead and he's just fucking shooting. He's just like shooting into the night. Yeah, he's got two massive machine guns, one in either hand. Doesn't have those yet. You're playing me again. <laughs> uh, so he's just shooting. He's just shooting off into the night, just trying to. Just trying to hit something off in the distance, and um, the and the war rig gets stuck. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this part because this is this is basically we're 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 hitting an hour and forty minutes in this podcast here. So um, basically, what, what what happens is the war rig gets stuck, and as this bullet farmer gets closer and closer with his with his vehicle, um, Max sits down with their with their one sniper rifle that they have, mm-hmm. and he st- and he fires, and he's he's got three shots. I think he's maybe has four shots, mm-hmm. and Furiosa calls out to him, you know, you got three left, and he shoots <laughs> one, two, he can't hit shit. Mm-hmm. Furiosa comes over and fucking pushes him down, mm-hmm. sits the fucking sits the uh, the barrel right next to his ear and says, don't breathe, and then fires, and she's able to hit the spotlight on the front of the convertible, and it blinds the bullet farmer. And so he gets crazy pissed, and there, and Nux is, at this whole this whole time, Nux is trying to wrap um, a, uh, a chain around a tree, the only tree in sight. They're in the middle of this swamp. There's a tree. They wrap a chain around it. They're trying to yank the war rig out because they're going to get caught by the bullet farmer if they don't. And, uh, and they're getting that free, and basically the bullet farmer flips because he's blind now, mm-hmm. and he takes out these two machine guns and just... And he actually has dialogue right there. It's really cool dialogue. I should have wrote it down, but they've got names. Yeah. He names one and the other. And he's like, fire, my brother. So he doesn't say fire, though, but it's another it's like real flavorful dialogue that really puts you into the world yeah. but um he's trying and the bullets are doo, 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 all and right around the readers are out in the open so they're like following diving them, so diving the for, yeah diving for cover and max basically says um i'm gonna go take care of this and furiosa says and this is the first moment you realize that this character this guy that she tried to murder the moment she met him that she su- he suddenly valuable her in some way mm-hmm. where she says what if uh what if we get free before you come back and he looks at her like, you go. Right. <laughs> Who cares about me? Like, at this point, you know, he knows what they're trying to do. Furiosa has told him about the green place and that she's trying to get the uh, the breeders there so that they're safe. She says she came from there. Mm-hmm. And this all happens during this. This right. is this downtime, this down right. period. This is where we get a little bit more cut up with some dialogue when we have a moment here. With a little bit of backstory, right. we find out Furiosa is from the, from the green place. Mm-hmm. She's trying to get back there. And uh, Max says, why? And she says, redemption. Mm-hmm. That's all she says. She doesn't say what she needs to be redeemed for. She just says redemption. Mm-hmm. And it's another one of those things where it's like there's so much gravitas, right. so much history to this character where we just can't know. And so Max takes off. You hear some what blah, 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 a couple gunshots, <laughs> an explosion, and here comes Max trudging back. Guess what? He's got an even bigger bag of guns. <laughs> he's got a pair of boots for Nux now. And he's got something else, too, that cracked me up, but I forget what it was. Oh, a steering wheel. Yeah. He, he's got a steering wheel. So they're able to put a real steering wheel back on the vehicle. Nux now is not barefoot anymore because right. Nux was wearing Max's boots. Right. He made him give him back. So, Nux, so <laughs> Nux has been running around barefoot. So so now that's even, that's even Max accepting Nux into the team. Mm-hmm. But Nux, that dialogue about the, the McFeasting with the Immorta in Valhalla and the redhead telling him maybe that wasn't your manifest destiny, mm-hmm. that's another moment where, the, where uh, Nux's allegiance mm-hmm. is like, well, if I, can't, if I can't impress Joe, maybe I can save these girls. Right. Maybe, because he can't ever face Joe again. Right. So now he's completely turned his allegiance to these girls. And again, the people who hate this movie or criticize this movie think that this is bad writing. To me, this is the brilliance and the multi-dimensional layer of this character and how crazy all these characters are mm-hmm. because this is the same group of girls that called him a smeg that eats sh- schlep or whatever the what was that one? Still clinging to the he's still clinging to Schlanger. This, he's, he's a still crazy to the faith. He's a crazy smeg who eats schle- uh, uh, schlanger, but now <laughs> now he's they've accepted him. Right. So Max has accepted him, Furiosa has accepted Max, and even the breeder girls have accepted Nux. So these weird end of the world moment by moment allegiances are are solidifying with our characters now. And now we we have our team. 
Right. This is now a team. This is Team Max or Team Furiosa. Just in time for the venture to make its U-turn and head back. So, uh, so this is another moment that happens, and we'll go ahead and get into this now. And this might be uh, this might be quite a <laughs> quite a bit quite a detour, but it's an important point mm -hmm. that I want to go over. So let's go over it now. One of the things we see at this point is one of the girls in the vehicle is playing with the toy box, mm -hmm. the little uh, or the, uh, the the toy the toy um, uh, uh, music box. Yeah, yeah, the toy music box is from. Correct me if I'm wrong. The music, excuse me, the music box is from Thunderdome. Okay. The charger gets blown up in Road Warrior. Mm -hmm. Max has both the charger and the music box in Fury Road. Mm -hmm. This is a key. He did, Miller didn't just put right, in good. another music box. Right. Miller put in the music box as a cue for where this movie takes place in the continuity right. of the film. And if you remember, not only in the beginning of voiceover narration, you get a little inkling audio-wise of this, but then if you remember, there's a moment or two where he's having like kind of crazy man flashbacks and visions. There's this recurring, very, very brief and quick, this little girl that has, you know, that he keeps going back to. And remember, at the beginning, he's talking about he was supposed to protect them. So it kind of helps tie all that together. So. so my question is, where does this movie take place in the continuity of the films? If both the toy box and the charger are present, mm -hmm. it can't be, it can't be after Road Warrior, and it can't be before um, uh, Thunderdome, but. The consensus has always been that Thunderdome takes place long after Road Warrior. Not only is Mel Gibson a lot older, but Mel yeah. Gibson has white in his beard in um, in the uh, in the Thunderdome, Thunderdome movie. Yeah. So if it has to take place after Thunderdome but before Road Warrior, how does that work? And then mm. here's my here's my answer. Mm. My answer is there is no continuity. Mm. None of these stories are real. These are all, Max is a composite character mm -hmm. at the end of the world, and these are crazy people telling the stories of Mad Max to each okay. other. And so, so like different versions of the, of the same story. So mythology. maybe this is the same, maybe these are different versions of the same story mm -hmm. being told by different people, or mm -hmm. maybe it's different Max stories. Again, yeah. this is George Miller's Wild West mm -hmm. um, story that he's telling. He's using post-apocalyptic imagery instead right. of Westerns, but this is a High Plains drifter. Mm -hmm. And in the High Plains Drifter stories, they drift in and out of these right. narratives and they don't ever get held down to a particular place or a particular time. So it's my guess that none of these films take place in any consecutive order. Yeah. These are just Mad Max stories. These are stories of the apocalypse drifter. He drifted into Furiosa's story right. in this uh, movie and in uh, in Beyond Thunderdome. He drifted yeah. into the Thunderdome. Is that what is the name of the town in uh, Thunderdome? Uh, Something city. It's, it's it's well the town. It's all about trading. Barter town. Barter town. Yeah, yeah. He drifts into Barter town and becomes part of Barter town story right. because Barter town gets destroyed. So we so right. literally, if you if we're sitting around a campfire in the apocalypse, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you about Barter Town. Mm -hmm. So there's this place called Barter Town, mm -hmm. and it was a crazy place. But I'm going to use the Mad Max character to tell the right. story. Yeah, and and sense. and if I'm going to tell the story, if you remember, the story of uh, Road Warrior mm -hmm. is told from a future perspective of mm -hmm. the feral kid that has the boomerang. Right. He's actually the narrator at the end of. Uh, Road Warrior, he's in the back of the car and he says, and I never saw Mad Max again. Hmm. And it's showing him looking at Max walking away right. or driving away at the end of the movie. So there's also another theory that this isn't the real Mad Max. Mm -hmm. That this is the feral kid who's taken on the identity of Mad Max. And that's why it's Tom Hardy and not, and not Mel Gibson. Yeah. And it's why he won't tell Furiosa his name. What does it matter who I am? And then at the end of the movie, which we'll get to here, I'm playing. I'm playing myself now, <laughs> jumping ahead. But when Max says his name's Max, she's not even conscious. He and he's reassuring himself. He right. says, "Max, I'm Max." Mm -hmm. He's going yeah. to tell him himself. I'm Max. Now. It's almost like that's mm -hmm. not Mel Gibson's Mad Max. Right. That that's the grown-up feral kid. Now I think George Miller denied that. I think yeah. he may have come out in a, in a. But that may just be in a sense to maintain the. 
And it's mystery, you know. So that so that's why I wanted to jump in and talk about the the to- the uh, music box right, right there because this scene that we're in 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 the moment in the mm-hmm. film is that's the the key that mm-hmm. Miller puts in there to uh, key to, to key somewhere. us in to connect them, but also to confuse us right. and make it seem <laughs> like well. Where in the fuck does this take place? I think he did, does that kind of stuff on purpose right. to throw us off and make sure there's no way to put these movies. Keep it as ambiguous as possible, yeah. but still tell an intriguing story. So, oh my God. Okay, so um, yeah, so we so we meet the uh, at this point we meet the mothers. I guess the uh, the the best the best way to uh, describe them is the mothers. They're the people yeah. who lived in the green place. They are the the, it's called the land the, of the, many mothers, the green place. Yeah, yeah, the land of many mothers. So we meet the many mothers. It's not so much true anymore. Kind of. We meet the many mothers, and Furiosa <laughs> says, "Well, what are you doing out here? Why don't we head off to the green place?" And I say, "You just came to the green place. It's that swamp." Which I think is key that we were there a little while. Yeah, we just didn't know where we were at the time. Yeah. So Furiosa loses her complete shit mm-hmm. because this is her. Um, this was everything her has whole, been done every, for this. This the the, re- the redemption she needed. She, she needed to get these um, these women to the green place, and now there's no such thing. Mm-hmm. It's gone. It's been turned into a swamp. She drops her arm. She screams into the night. Does Everyone, the proverbial no. Does the uh, yeah the the Darth Vader at the end of episode three <laughs> no. And uh, and so th- that's the moment where they all uh, they all get on their motorcycles. They leave the war rig. Furiosa says again. Now this is how you know that this Max character has found found his way into her respect and her reverence forever. Is she tells him, "Look, we're going to drive 100. We have enough food and gas to drive these bikes 163 days through the salt. And the salt is basically just the endless wasteland desert right. with no civilization. Mm-hmm. Like the citadel is." The last, or the Tri City, um, is the last vestige yeah. of uh, of, uh, of humanity left, right. and they're going to try to uh, basically see what they can find on the other side of the. Well, uh, this basically, this scene basically becomes sort of the first little micro step towards maybe something that somewhat resembles a return to sanity, because essentially the the metaphor here is, and I'm sorry if I'm if I'm playing you again, <laughs> <laughs> but. But, but uh, you know, she she's all for just driving out into the unknown and just hoping for the best. And he basically says, like you said earlier, all you're going to find is more desert. Basically what he's saying is the, 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 the classic Albert Einstein quote, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Where he says, and, and this is I'm sure where you're going next, that's where he comes up with this master plan. So, so they so take off. Perfect. They take off driving, and he and he takes off after him. After hearing some more voices, right. um, he takes <laughs> off. He takes off after him and stops him. And he's basically like, "Look, you can drive 163 days, and you're gonna find nothing but more desert, or we could turn around and drive back to the citadel." And they're going. Well, they're just all kind of and they crazy. literally, they she literally, is. one of the one of the one of the breeders says, "I thought you weren't crazy anymore." <laughs> right. And he says, "No, think about it." And Morton Joe's gone. The war boys are, and they all start to figure it out at that moment. Like the Citadel is completely undefended. All there is is the the war pups and the war dogs that are too sick to fight. So there's nothing there. They can right. go back and, and they've got the war rig. Mm-hmm. They can fucking capture the Citadel. Plow through there. So they do. Right. They get back in the fucking war rig and they go driving. And they and there's this scene where Morton Joe's just kind of sitting. Of those, those holy shit, they're doing that. So uh, there's a moment right before this where uh, Splendid finally dies mm-hmm. and they cut uh, they cut the baby out of her. And there's this weird moment where. Um, where the guy that cuts the uh, the, the baby the out of her says uh, mechanic, they call the organic mechanic <laughs> basically says um, you know uh, god damn it what's his name again um, the Rictus where he goes you Rictus you had a baby brother who's perfect in every way and, and Rictus <laughs> crawls up back out of the vehicle and he goes I had a baby brother and he was perfect in every way <laughs> and the thing is it's like that was what they were after. That's Joe's whole master plan was to lock those girls into that hermetically sealed chamber and keep them free and of radiation the throne, essentially. and create a, a un, un uh, uh, like non deformed, yeah. non cancerous bloodline. Yeah. reset. and it was happening, and it right. and it was dead in front of him, like Done like before it started. Furiosa yeah. and Max killed his mm-hmm. bloodline, and so he's just kind of sitting in the fucking in the dirt at this point, and uh, the. Uh, the people eater from Gastown is, is sitting there too and they're all just kind of sitting in the dirt 
And then what, and somebody goes, hey, uh, Joe, there goes the war rig. And he goes, what? And, and, the, and the people leader is like, where the hell are they going? And Joe, again, instantly. He no, it's, it's the Citadel. It's undefended. They know it's Let's undefended. Go. And so the movie ramps right back up. And the two warrior drums. Do, 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 do. And they fucking, and this is my, if, if the, if the, um, if the broken gun, uh, uh, chained, uh, uh, fight, fist fight with Fur- one armed yeah. Furiosa is my favorite scene in the movie. My second favorite scene in the movie is here comes. So the uh, Joe's War Party is able to catch back up, mm-hmm. and now here is Split in Max's <laughs> Charger comes right up next to the War Rig, and uh, Split's got a driver, and he climbs out onto the fucking uh, mm-hmm. uh, hood of the car, and he starts spitting nitrous directly into the fucking uh, engine to make the engine go faster and he's trying to cut off cut off the war rig and he's basically gonna they're gonna kamikaze or kama crazy themselves to stop the war rig and so Nux crawls out and he's got his own and he pulls off one of the hoses um, the nitrous hose leading into the engine and he sucks it into his mouth and they're basically having a fucking <laughs> spit off they're where they're spitting it. nitrous and and the uh, and the war rig hits a rock and Nux chokes on it and he can't he can't yeah. do it and um, uh, Split is able to get ahead so Max jumps down there and Max starts fucking um, uh, doing this and it's this fucking cr- absolute again these characters have to be completely insane to be doing this kind of thing and it's because they know. That they, they have, without hesitation. They have just, no time. No. They have no life. If you from hesitate, one, you die. From what, if you hesitate, you die is the perfect way to describe mm-hmm. this uh, the atmosphere of this world that, that George Miller's built. The brink of the of of extinction. Mm-hmm. The, these characters. And so they are willing to crawl out on the hoods of these vehicles going eighty miles an hour through the desert and spit nitrous into the <laughs> engines just to get that little edge because this moment is the only moment that matters. Mm-hmm. So that's where that happens. Um, and then, and there's another little piece of flavor here that I really like a lot. That again just colors into how the war, how how the war boys work, and how their weapons work and everything. So coming up behind the um, the fucking war rig are these cars that shoot these harpoons into the back mm-hmm. of the war rig, and what they they're called plows. And right. so what these cars have is on the backs of them, they literally have. These um, like big old anchors, big anchors that the whenever they they click a switch that after they they mm-hmm. fucking basically they harpoon mm-hmm. they tie it off tie off the harpoon onto the um, body of the the frame of the vehicle and then they drop these anchors into the ground anchors on wheels, and so basically. now the the the. the um, the war rig is dragging cars behind it, and it's slowing it down. It's letting. And in the end, Mort- we've got like two, maybe three of these. Hooked in. It's letting a Morton Joe's uh, cars mm-hmm. come up uh, to the thing, and so this is when the pole cats finally <laughs> attack. And so the, way, I mean, I have to describe here at this point the way that uh, George Miller shoots this war rig is this <laughs> war rig might as well be two hundred feet long. <laughs> the way he gets in close mm-hmm. and gets these wide angle long shots I mean they they're literally from the pod from the fuel pod to the main um, the, the main um, um, uh, what do they call it the, the rig the right. back the, piece yeah the, the trailer the trailer full yeah. of mother's milk and right. then the, and then there's a it's a double ex- I mean it might even be a triple cab there's right. like two cabs. That are, yeah, it's kind of like Joe's car. It's like yeah, kind of like built up. It so there's all these different areas where fighting can take place, mm-hmm. and the way he, and he uses it every and he level. uses every <laughs> inch of this war rig. So this war rig really feels like four or five sets right. when it's only this maybe thirty five foot long. Right. Typical tr- tractor tr- trailer. Tr- size. Yeah, tractor trailer truck, like thirty five feet long, but it's got five different sets built onto it that he shoots every angle of shoots it with wide angle Mm -hmm. shoots it in 3d and really makes it feel like this thing is enormous Mm -hmm. and so the pole cats start dropping down and the pole cat one of the pole cats has a noose and he drops in and he hooks furiosa (laughs) and furiosa's getting strangled and then some of them have bomb sticks and they're dropping the bomb sticks onto the rig trying to blow the tires see the return of the 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 wrist crossbows Chris wrist crossbows come back one of the one of the, one of the few times Max gets gets really his bell rung in this movie that's coming up here right like yeah during this fight yep. he takes one of those crossbow bolts essentially in the in the forehead literally but he puts takes his hand up in time so it 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 goes through his hand 
to where it only it, it goes into his forehead, but just enough to where it's stuck there. And he's just kind of laying there for a minute during all this action. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have that right here. That's my very yeah. next thing. So one of the one of the polecats has ch a chainsaw. Mm -hmm. So there's chainsaws coming right. down. There's more bomb mm -hmm. sticks coming down. They've got nooses. These fucking polecats are awesome. So all of Joe's rigs are all around. Mm -hmm. So this thing is completely the war rig is completely in, in, encapsulated with all this because mm -hmm. the uh, because the plows. The anchors it out, are right. dragging it back, and uh, because this thing, like like she said, it's two thousand horsepower of mm -hmm. nitrous fucking uh, boosted engine. So this mm -hmm. thing is faster than any of those cars. Right. But they've got they've got it um, anchored back right now. Mm -hmm. So Max gets out and he's headed to the back to, to with the bolt cutters mm -hmm. because he's going to cut the the uh, the cars free, the plows right. free, the anchors mm -hmm. free. And uh, yeah, he takes one of the crossbows right and he puts his, his hand, up just, puts his hand up just in time and takes a shot <laughs> right in the head. And so he's I literally what I wrote down here was Max shot with a handbow right in the fucking face. Um, <laughs> and he just, well, all this is going around him, he just, and you see him just, it's a momentary pause that Miller gives you. The expression on his face, he's laying there, and it's just the most pure uh, depiction of what the fuck just happened. Almost like what, with his hands or almost or almost like what am I doing? Right. <laughs> Why am I here? Why, Why am I here? doing this? Yeah. Um, so then, then one of the uh, war boys cr crawls into the cab, takes that fucking knife um, that we it was foreshadowed earlier right. when I Furiosa would, showed that she had shift, the, the yeah. stick shift knife. Grabs the stick shift knife and jams it into Furiosa's side mm. and pierces her right in the lung. Right. And Furiosa is just oh, just gritting and bearing it, and she keeps driving forward. And um, Nux, Nux this whole time, they've blown it in. Not only are they getting drug, but they've blown engine one. They've got two right. engines. Nux, I've, I've, I've missed the dialogue. I was going to go back and write it down. But they ask him, are you a black something? Oh, yeah, black thumb. Like a green Black thumb. thumb. Yeah. So they, in other words, are you a mechanic? They yeah. literally have a term called black <laughs> thumb because, it's, again, they fetishize these machines. Their god is called the V8. They worship the V8. They say right. praise to V8 whenever they take their steering wheels <laughs> off of the shrine. And so they ask you, do you have a do you have a black thumb? And, and uh, oh, well, yeah. So <laughs> Nux grabs the tools, and he goes down, and he's been fixing the engine. So they get the engine fixed, mm -hmm. and you see everybody says, there's, you know, everybody is like, you know, Oh my God! Think he, he yells out, "Engine one's back online!" And everybody's like, "Oh, there's still hope. Hope is this word. It's a bad word." Right. Max tells these girls before they go back that you know, hope. If if you have hope in something, I, I should have written it down. Mm -hmm. I don't have the quote exactly right, but basically, if you have hope, uh, you're gonna drive yourself crazy with it. Right. Is basically what he said. But here it is. There's still hope. There's still the, a chance that they could get back to the citadel. So. Um, uh, oh, so this is the moment where um, uh, uh, basically the uh, the people eater also has a uh, trailer mm. rig, but his trailer rig has gasoline in it, mm. um, and he he pulls up next to the oh, war yeah. rig and basically sandwiches um, slice or I'm sorry what? split. Um, in in Max's charger, mm -hmm. and the charger gets pulled up between the two, and then right at the, you know, and 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 uh, Split basically screams screams out Valhalla mm -hmm. and blows up, and that's right. and that's the end of uh, that's the end of Split, um, and then uh, and then Joe Joe rolls back onto the scene, and mm -hmm. now and now it's a uh, Joe basically um, let's see, well it ends up being him and Furiosa. Well, we're not there. We're not, not quite, quite there yet. yet. So Joe rolls back onto the scene in his uh, in his car, mm -hmm. his regular car, because he blew up right. the monster truck. So he's back in his triple decker vehicle, and um, that they end up. One thing happens, one thing leads to another, and they're able to. Uh, uh, I think it happens when Max finally crawls in the back and is able to snip the plows off. Right. One of the plows run uh, hits the fucking um, the other truck. Uh, the other truck and blows up the fucking blows, yeah. this gigantic fuck <laughs> the biggest explosion in the movie yet mm -hmm. ba boom right. this thing blows up and um and they're and they're headed back to the pass right and now the only the only way that joe and the and the, the tri-city raiders were able to get through the pass is that they they have they didn't show it on screen but, but they, they clear clearly it. cleared it so they're yeah. gonna head back through it they're gonna boom right back through the pass the thing is the pass is narrow right they can't They've all been fanned out. They got a single file. So they jump in single file, and what it ends up being is it ends up being Joe's vehicle, the war rig, and then um, 
uh, Rick, I believe it's Rictus is in a vehicle in the back. So these are the three main vehicles that end up filing, single file in line as they're headed back to the pass. And um, there, then there, there's actually a really funny uh, scene where just like Morton Joe was just sort of mm. sitting there playing in the fucking sand, the ri- the writers uh, hear the war party, co- like they hear the explosion uh-huh. from the fucking uh, man eaters um, rig. Right. And they look up like, what the fuck? <laughs> and it's just this cool, they don't do anything. I don't think they right. have another scene in the movie. It's just no. that the, the, the camera, the camera yeah. shots on them. When we see the explosion, then it cuts to them and they hear, but boom, they look back. What the fuck is going on over there? <laughs> So the rigs are jammed up. Jammed up. Joe's leading the pack. Uh, the war rig is next. And uh, oh no, it's the Doof Warriors. Uh, it, I think it's it's Rictus driving the Doof Warriors vehicle. So yeah. the Doof Warriors in the back, and Max now is fighting with the Doof Warrior, and ends up uh, this really funny yeah. sequence where he ends up beating the shit out of the, uh, the yeah. Doof that's Warriors. where his mask thing comes off, and it's yeah. like a, a like a hybrid between like Marilyn Manson and a Cenobite or something. Right. Right, and then this is where it happens. Uh, Furiosa gets out. She says, you're going to have to drive. And I forget, is it Nux? Nux takes over. Yeah. Nux takes over the vehicle, and Furiosa right. crawls out, jumps across, and she gets right up next to, uh, she gets right outside of Joe's vehicle. Hanging right outside the vehicle, yeah. And she, uh, and he looks, and, and Max and Rictus are fighting. She's got him. one of the spear, Rick, like, I think it's one of the, it's harpoons, one of the harpoons. Yeah. Rictus, Rictus and Max are fighting on the hood of the other vehicle, so there's all this, this chaos going on, and Furiosa gets up into uh, in Morton Joe's face and says, remember me? And shoots the fucking harpoon, or just, no, just reaches in it, with the harpoon, hooks, it, hooks it into his fucking face mask, and then drops the chain down into the wheels, and it fucking rips in Morton Joe's whole fucking face off. <laughs> rips his fucking <laughs> face off. Goodbye, and Morton Joe. Wow. What a, what a way... To take out your villain. Right. And now we're back in the pass. And the vehicles are headed into the pass. And this is and this this ends up being this ends up being the swan song for Nux. He gets one final opportunity. Now remember, mm-hmm. remember the way he looked in reverence mm-hmm. to those those war boys it's dying in the storm. And where he, he says, says to him where he, he said Witness up in the storm, and he gets now this look on his face like I've he knows. Seen the light, he knows what he, he has says, to do. Witness me. Well, he's the girls are in the car in front of him. Right. His redhead, his new girlfriend. They're looking at she's him looking directly at him, too. and he's driving the rig. Mm-hmm. And he realizes what he can do. Mm-hmm. What he can do is he can block off the entire raiding party if he sacrifices himself and blows the ridge again by wrecking the war rig. Right. And so he just says. He's he realizes now is the moment, mm-hmm. and he's it's it's no machismo, right. it's no aggro alpha male chest pounding. Witness me, witness me. No, it's more like I found suddenly him on. he's in. It's just like I don't even know so much as it's not pleasure, as then he just knows the the weight. He knows mm-hmm. he's gonna die. Right. He finally like when it's like he's been. But he's he, gonna die the death. That he's he been wants. fantasizing it mm-hmm. over and over again for the last two days about dying. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when it finally happens, it's not this big pound your chest moment. It's very peaceful, mm-hmm. and he just whispers to his girlfriend up in the car in front of him, "Witness me." Mm-hmm. And then he fucking yanks the wheel and he <laughs> blows the rig, and the pass closes mm-hmm. back down, crumbles again, and and, and the, the Doof Warrior goes flying up on his bungee cord. <laughs> the Doof Warrior fucking the the and in the three D if you saw it in the theater yeah. the the fucking uh, well the three D so strong in that scene even on Blu Ray without the three D you can be like okay that's kind of three D looking yeah the 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 guitar on the bungees comes the forward wheel. and then a steering wheel comes flying at you end scene yep. the steering wheel comes at your fucking face and then it goes screen goes black. And Nux has gotten his glorious death. Mm-hmm. Nux is now the pass is blocked, so they're clear from any of them catching up. And now Nux is McFeasting with the <laughs> Immorta <laughs> in Valhalla, <laughs> shiny and chrome. So it's it's home. And this free now. this this is the moment where uh, and Furiosa is wheezing and she's dying. Mm-hmm. Furiosa is out for the count. And uh, they, the girls ask, why is he, ask Max, why is she breathing this way? And he says, um, her, her, she's, she's collapsing her lung. She's well, got I mean, air in her lung. And every breath she takes, she's collapsing her lung well, further I mean, and she, further. And the, one, of the, one of the breeders says also she's exaggerated. She's, 
she lost all her blood. Lost all her blood. So. so he stabs her in the in the chest, mm-hmm. and uh, and he says, "I'm really sorry. This is gonna hurt." And he stabs <laughs> her in the chest, and you hear. Right. She takes a deep breath, and he's able to get her back going again. And they, they say she's still going to bleed out, and so he's still got from the beginning of the her. from the beginning of the movie. He's <laughs> still got the, the tube, yeah. yeah, he's still got the damn the uh, the uh, the line run right. into his vein. And uh, so he just well, no, it's, he's got the line, but it's not connected to him. It's like there or something. No, it's connected to him. It's not connected oh, it's to her. Right, 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 right. Okay. So he just gets the needle he out, sticks it in her, and arm. sticks it in her arm, and so he becomes Furiosa's blood, blood bag, bag 2.0. <laughs> all the way back to the Citadel. Right. And basically, they you know, there's no there's no defense. At there's which a, point she's come to somewhat. There's a few guys that are trying to act big and bad, but as they said, right. it's these it's the war boys that. Uh, that are too sick right. to uh, to fight, so they're they're trying to break. But you know, what are you doing? And they do have guns. Yeah, I mean, and they have the high ground. They have control of the citadel, so there's a chance they would be able to just snipe them off and kill them. But uh, they have Max has other ideas. Right. He's got Morton Joe's body right. on the hood of the car, and it's just sort of it's kind of common knowledge, especially if you study history. Like when the dictator dies, it doesn't matter how many people he led. Or how many you know forces he had when the dictator dies? That's the end of the dictatorship. The and so they they kick his body off. Like I think it was Mussolini. They drug his body through the street yeah. and hung him and dismembered him and <laughs> set him on fire. And once Mussolini was dead, that was the end of the regime. You know, it wasn't. Well, Joe got dismembered, and he sure. and and so they they kick him off the vehicle mm-hmm. and all those crab people. <laughs> Basically, run up and tear his body, and they tear just his running back off with like leg here, body and parts here. and clothes, and just whatever they could from right. Morton Joe. And then the war boy, all the war pups, mm-hmm. the war pups say, "Let him up, mm-hmm. let him up." And so they, they drive the go. they drive the vehicle onto the uh, onto the the um, onto the lift, and they lift and they lift everybody up and uh, and the, and the, all the because see what they had done in the first scene except for Max. What they had done in the plan me again. What they done. What they had done in the first scene was they had lowered the uh, they had lowered the lift so that Furiosa could drive right. the war rig off, and all the crab people were trying to jump up onto it. And they were kicking them off, kicking them right. off, kicking them off. You don't get up here. You're the low. You're low level people. Right. This is a hierarchy. This is a this is a dictatorship, mm-hmm. and you're not invited. Right. And when Furiosa's vehicle, when when Max drives Furiosa's vehicle up onto the lift, they let as many townsfolk as can fit. Get well, onto right. the it's lift. actually Joe's vehicle that they were, that they were yeah. in. Yeah, and uh, and so they, as they're coming up, there's sort of a again just visually, there's no dialogue, but it's like the it's the end of the dictatorship. This mm-hmm. is going to be a free democracy mm-hmm. where they're letting the the people from down below, and they run and the and the mothers, the milk moms, they run up and they turn the water on right. and they let it flow free. And, and the, the the elevator essentially the vehicle elevator going up lifting. Furiosa up, it, it's 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 implying, um, it, it's metaphorically implying like she's going to take over as the leader. She's going to lead this this people. While Max stays below. Yeah, Max. She glances around looking for Max. She looks down. He's actually in the crowd, and he right. looks up at her, and he just nods, mm-hmm. and she just nods back again. No dialogue between them, and he just fades off into the Once into again, the distance. The drifter comes and goes, and uh, and the shot cuts up, and it's this badass. Um, Underneath shot mm-hmm. as it shows Furiosa lifting up, lifting mm-hmm. up, lifting up, and then it cuts to black. Mm-hmm. And the film ends with this quote: "It says, where must we go? We who wander this wasteland in search of our better selves.' Mm-hmm. And that essentially is what this whole ride has been about. This whole let's drive to point A, let's drive from point A to point B, and turn around and drive back right. has been for redemption." has been for uh, Nux to finally get his glorious death, has been for Max to try to silence these voices in his head that he wasn't able to help, that he wasn't able to save. Well, damn it, I saved these people. And Maybe you know, the... It what it looked like to her for Furiosa to get her redemption. You know. Yeah, we don't know what she was after. We don't know what her redemption was. Right. But it maybe wasn't this, but... Maybe this is good enough. Right. And, you know, and she can, you know... She can embrace the people like Joe would, kind of a scenario. For however much longer they're going to fucking right. live, because again, they're living at the brink of extinction. And but they, the whole time, they if you remember when the, oh, I don't remember her name, but the old lady, the sea keeper, I think mm-hmm. was her name. 
They say for bag of seeds. That's a big. That's and, a big role. That's there. a big character that right. I didn't talk about was the, the what maybe the oldest the mothers, maybe the yeah. oldest gnarliest many mother right. sort of about a handful of them. sort of gave off this little bag of seeds to mm-hmm. the youngest and prettiest mm-hmm. of all of the uh, breeders and basically said I need you to keep well she gets sliced in the throat right. she's dying and she just pushes the seeds back right. to make sure that the young beautiful girl gets a hold of them in other words the next generation is right. going to plant the seeds when they leave she, she has to kind of like pause and the double take and goes back for the bag of seeds grabs those seeds and given where they're at the citadel is is lush with water so they're going to so, so hopefully foreshadowing that there's hope that yeah again that hope right. that word mm-hmm. if you have too much hope if you have hope in the wrong <laughs> thing it'll drive you crazy uh, there may be hope the, in this world. There's after a lot of dialogue somewhere in there where they mention something about the soil at the Citadel being of quality because it yeah. hasn't been used for anything. So right. he plants little bits of dialogue to help move things along. He just doesn't rely on the dialogue. So that, dear watchers, <laughs> is Mad Max Fury Road, one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life, Travis. Where does it fall in your... Oh, absolutely. Best, best film overall of 2015, in my opinion. I think one of the best movies of the decade. Oh, yeah. yeah. And action movie, I mean, it's easily in the top five action movies of all time. And came out of fucking nowhere. Yeah. And it's been in development hell forever since, like I said, as early as 1997. Um, and just, just, I think it surprised everyone. Even the people that had a positive outlook on it were... Were pleasantly it's surprised. Very rare that again in this day and age where you are sort of micromanaged all the way through pre-production, production, post-production, the trailers, and then the premiere, uh, and then the Rotten Tomatoes score, and then the uh, opening box or the opening weekend box office results. Right. Like you just sort of are walked through every aspect of a film in public now, and it's hard to stay excited about a film. And it's it's almost it's so rare that a film exceeds expectations. Right, and so on that note, as of today, earlier on I checked, according to Box Office Mojo, as of today, the worldwide take for Mad Max Fury, Fury Road, we're at three hundred seventy-eight million eight hundred thousand and some change. So for a movie that costs a hundred million, if you figure you double that for marketing, it's not doing terribly bad in the long run. Yeah, it was very, very, and is that does that include um, DVD streaming, Blu-ray, or is that just that, box? Uh, that just the theatrical box office. That's um, no, I mean I, I believe that's worldwide total of everything, everything, all media that it's been sold on. That's not bad. That's yeah, not bad. they've even got they've got which I wish I could have seen, and I'll see eventually, but um, they've even got it separated out for the black and chrome yeah. edition. So that's not a that that I don't I don't know. They might even have that separated out because they're. I guess they're looking at it as a different entity. Sure. So, so this is what we're going to be doing on here, gang. This is our. We wanted to do one of our, our both of our very favorite films of all time for our first show, just to really give you guys a good taste of what you're going to be in for. This is what we're going to do for all of our favorite films, and we're gonna we're gonna show you guys. We're gonna walk through movies like this that we're sure you've seen, but maybe you didn't see it on the deeper level that we were able to present it to you but some of these movies you'll have never even heard of before and we're going to present them to you with the same energy and the same feeling and we're going to give you guys some great uh some some great uh uh, cinema throughout the course of uh watching with strangers and the best thing you can do for us if you enjoy what you what you hear here on this show here here here, here. The show is to support us on Patreon by um, donating as little as one dollar a month, and we'll figure out. We don't have any um, perks for this show yet, uh, but we will figure out some perks for this show to hook you guys up with. And um, and yeah, what what is our what is our next film? Our next film, I believe, is the Monster Squad. Okay, so a, a 1980s classic. Again, one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm sure we'll spend a lot of time just talking about... By another about filmmaker that has an interesting story. Fred Decker? Yeah. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Tied into our third film. Exactly, which we'll, we'll, we'll get cover to, at that We'll get point. to before. So, <laughs> listen, gang, I had a lot of fun doing this, Travis. Me too. Do you have anything else you want to add here? Do anything we didn't get oh, to Oh, there's cover? all sorts of stuff we couldn't, we didn't, that we didn't get to, but, you know, there's another day for that. Two hours and 20 minutes, brother. Yeah, that's, that's a long haul. 
But it was fun. Good time. So until next time, keep watching. What's up, watchers? You fucking stranger watchers. We're uh, we're Kevin Strange and Travis, and we're here to talk about the Patreon page. <laughs> All right, stop it. Let's figure it. Why? 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 Oh, I don't know. We got ten seconds. Patreon, awesome. KevinStrange.com. <laughs> no, Patreon.com slash Kevin Strange. Check it out. Fuck. All music heard on the Watching with Strangers podcast, courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 HTTP colon slash slash creativecommons.org slash license slash by slash 3.0 slash.